and I'm definitely happy that uh, we will be presenting to you a uh, enough, uh, a timely you know, um, symposium and that is on invasive fungal disease. Definitely we have seen the emergence of this uh, important problem in infectious diseases, particularly among the vulnerable as we see uh, cancer patients, receiving chemotherapy, transplant recipients, and of course, HIV AIDS. And certainly, we commonly see this in this group of patients as opportunistic infections. But the biggest problem is, of course, the detection and the diagnosis. And certainly, of course, uh, when we talk about the management, it's also necessary for us you know, to uh, be able to um, to identify, of course, a specific bug causing the uh, serious fungal disease. And we are also blessed and fortunate that we have you know, a dynamic panel, a dynamic faculty for this symposium. Uh, we have divided the activity into two sets. First, of course, the didactics, and second would be the case-based panel discussion. And for our first speaker, um, we have a very consensus um, and definitely uh, one of the best ID specialists that I know. She is an adult infectious diseases consultant of Cardinal Santos Medical Center. Uh, so we have Dr. Jennifer Chua, who will be giving us a lecture on the issues and realities of invasive fungal disease in the Philippines. To be followed, this will be followed by a series of lectures on diagnostic dilemmas. Uh, the first lecture will be given by Dr. Mitzi Marie Chua, an adult infectious disease consultant of uh, Chongwa Medical Center in Cebu. She is a board examiner of the PSMID, a member of the Asia Fungal Working Group. International Society for Human and Animal Mycology. She is an associate professor of the Cebu Institute of Medicine and the chair of the Department of Microbiology and Parasitology of the same institution. She will discuss um, biomarkers, don't confuse their use. To be followed by Dr. Jackson T the chairman of the Department of Radiology of Makati Medical Center, the officer in charge of Capital Medical Center, CT MRI training officer of the Philippine Heart Center, and senior consultant of the MRI Center, Chinese General Hospital and Medical Center, who will discuss um, image, radiologic imaging, manifestations, and modalities. And last in the group of speakers for the diagnostic dilemmas is the past president of the PSMID. Um, he is the head of the Department of Clinical Pathology, Institute of Pathology, Chinese General Hospital and Medical Center, the chief, the microbiology section, division of clinical pathology of USC hospital, the chief of the microbiology section, Institute of Pathology, St. Luke's Medical Center, Global City, an advisor and a board examiner of the PSMID and a member of the American Society of Microbiology. So this is Dr. Evelina Lagamayo, who will discuss uh, histopathologic findings, cues, and clues. Mm -hmm. for, for the second phase, or the first, second part of our activity, to be a case-based panel discussion, wherein three interesting cases of fungal infections um, to be presented by our young and dynamic ID consultants, Dr. Sibel Abad, Dr. Jed Reyes, and Dr. Jelsa Sabat. And to be part of the reactors, along with Dr. Alagamayo and Dr. Jackson Lee, we will have a foreign guest, no? uh, Dr. Ilan, Ilan Swartz. He's an assistant professor, Division of Infectious Diseases, Department of Medicine, Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry, University of Alberta. He has a doctorate in Medical Sciences, Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Antwerp, Belgium. 
and he's currently a consultant at the General and Transplant Infectious Diseases, University of Alberta Hospital, Alberta Health Sciences. So definitely, uh, we have prepared you know, a, a, a timely and of course a, a worthy discussion for this morning. And I'd like to thank, of course, our module program developer, Dr. Minet Rosario, uh, along with our moderator later, Dr. Raquel Carma. So again, welcome to this morning's event, Infectious Disease, uh, infects, uh, Invasive Fungal Disease in Symposium. Thank you very much. We will now have Dr. Jennifer Chua. Just checking, can I be heard? Yes. Thank you. Good morning. To start off this morning's symposium on invasive fungal disease, I will share with you my insights on the issues and realities in the, on the management of high infect, um, invasive fungal diseases in the country. Advances in health technology, intensive care, transplantation, cancer therapy, immunosuppressive therapy have greatly improved the care and outcome of the critically ill patients, those with cancer and those with chronic inflammatory conditions. However, they have also increased the number of IFIs through the years and expanded the population at risk for invasive fungal infection and the fungal pathogens not previously considered pathogenic in humans. Invasive fungal diseases are also known to occur among HIV patients, patients with COPD, tuberculosis, trauma, which we have plenty of. We do not know the extent of invasive fungal diseases in the country or what endemic fungal infection exists or prevails in the country. The Philippines is endemic for TB. Urban and rural areas have high rates of COPD and both B and COPD are associated with chronic pulmonary aspergillosis, for which we have no data on. Dr. Bat and Dr. Denning, based on health statistics in the country gathered from DOH, WHO, the Philippine Dermatological Society Health Information System database, and the HIV AIDS registry of the Philippines, as well as population estimates of certain fungal infections, made an actuarial estimate on serious fungal infections in the Philippines for the year 2016. In this table, one can see that the not insignificant estimated number of cases of cryptococcal meningitis, pneumocystis pneumonia, invasive aspergillosis, candidemia, mycetoma, and chronic pulmonary aspergillosis, which are largely diagnosed to this day. Epidemiological studies are needed to validate these estimates, facilitating appropriate medical care of patients and proper prioritization of limited resources. Diagnosis of most IFDs remain a challenging task for many reasons, one of which is its non-specific clinical presentation. One of the most crucial predictors of clinical outcome in patients with invasive fungal diseases, especially in the immunocompromised, is time to early diagnosis and early appropriate management. Timely intervention in, in turn requires rapid diagnosis and sufficient identification about the offending fungi to guide antifungal therapy. Despite many developments in molecular diagnosis of fungal infections, histopathologic examination together with culture is still the gold standard to make a definitive diagnosis of IFIs. In resource limited countries, including the Philippines, diagnosis of IFI is mostly based on histology and conventional culture of the organism when available. 
Histologic examination of infected tissue is currently the swiftest diagnostic modality available, yet it is not without its pitfalls. On morphologic grounds, the diagnosis of spurgulosis can be confused, can be mistaken for other hyaline septate molds, such as Fusarium, Cidosporium, and Pseudoalecheria. The latter diagnosis has therapeutic implications since treatment of mucormycosis differs in a substantial way from that of aspergillosis. Fungal culture for the identification of fungi has, as we all know, a turnaround time of days to weeks, on the average about two weeks. In addition, the sensitivity of culture is only 50 to 60%. And in the diagnosis of invasive candidiasis, the most common invasive fungal infection in clinical practice, the diagnostic sensitivity of blood cultures that is considered the gold standard is estimated to be less than 50%. Because of the limitations associated with relying on conventional fungal culture method and histopathology in making a diagnosis of IFIs, the detection and identification of fungi after growth in culture and directly from specimens by molecular techniques have emerged and is rapidly in evolving. And these include antigen detection like PALAS and the biomarker, biomarkers which have a rapid turnaround time. We have also Malvito mass spectrometer, mass spectrometry that can shorten the time to identification once the organism has been isolated. Real-time PCR, some of which can be applied directly into specimens such as PCR for pneumocystis pneumonia has a rapid turnaround time. What are some of the issues and realities of IFIs in the Philippines? because of the often non-specific clinical presentation of invasive fungal infection, diagnosis of IFI often requires a high index of suspicion considering the exposure history, risk factors for IFIs and clinical findings among others. There is a lack of awareness among physicians of the growing IFIs in clinical practice. Appropriate workups may not be performed. Often, there may be a need to do more than the routine test. CT scan and invasive pro procedures may be needed to confirm the diagnosis of IFI. These tests and procedures are generally inaccessible in many parts of the country, except in the bigger cities and in Metro Manila. The cost of doing such workups can also be prohibitive. Even in hospitals with specialized care, sometimes appropriate mycological tests, especially from invasive procedures, are often not requested. I think my colleagues can resonate with this. How often have we received a referral after a histopath result which showed suspicious fungal elements? and the pathologist can be, cannot be more specific than that. No tissue has been sent for fungal culture, and I'd say, Siam, what a lost opportunity. While IFI is often made from histological, histologic examination, because of the availability of pathologies in many areas of the country, histopathologic findings should be correlated with the results of culture which may not be feasible in clinical practice due to the frequent absence of a requested microbiologic culture and the largely unavailability of fungal diagnostics, including fungal culture in many parts of the country. This in turn is related to the lack of training in mycology. We should improve on our laboratory aids in the diagnosis of IFI. There are few laboratories in the country that can do proper conventional culture isolation and identification of fungi, nor even a proper microscopic examination of the KOH mount, which needs patience and expertise. 
I've seen a chunk of tissue just drop into a tube with subroids media instead of being minced into smaller pieces first. Despite new developments in the laboratory diagnosis of IFI and considering the cost of new diagnostic techniques, classic fungal culture continue to be relevant and necessary in the detection and identification of fungi to aid in the diagnosis of IFIs. For many years from the 1970s to around the early years of the 21st century, Dr. Glenn Balmer well known, well known to many of the older generation IDs, would conduct annual one-month medical mycology courses in the country, from where many of our very limited seasoned mycologists who are not getting younger had their training. I may be wrong, but I think for many years now, there are no organized formal medical mycology training in the country. This needs to be continued to ensure that IFIs, which are growing, are diagnosed properly and treated. We can consider three levels of training or my mycology laboratory, perhaps in coordination with PAMET, the Association of Medical Technologies. We can have training on how to prepare samples and specimens for fungal cultures properly and to improve on microscopy examination for fungal elements among laboratory doing routine laboratory tests in regions where ID physicians are available. They can identify certain laboratory staff who are likely to stay in the country and who are willing to learn. They can undergo more intensive training on culture morphologic identification of fungal pathogens that can be province or region based. These provincial or regional mycology labs can receive the fungal culture tubes from other laboratories doing routine lab tests for morphologic ID and can, can perform other tests like talus, yeast speciation, and antimicrobial susceptibility test, testing. On the third level, a national reference center and perhaps later regional reference centers when funds available in mycology can be established where more difficult fungi are sent for further workup and where rapid, newer rapid diagnostic tests are available. The regional or national reference center will also provide hands-on mycology training. There should be a protocol for consultation and networking between the three levels of mycology lab. The Asia Fungal Working Group for Dr. Mitsi Chua is a member, a working group under the International Society for Human and Animal Mycology have established one to three month mycology training courses to, to equip trainees with the knowledge, interpretation and laboratory skills to support the establishment and local mycology lab services. According to Dr. Mitsi Chua, one individual from the Philippines, a dermatologist, had underwent the training course. We should provide support for advanced training in medical mycology. What do we have within our midst? Over the last three decades, we have been able to adopt more fungal diagnostic tests that can improve our ability to diagnose IFI in a timely manner. Through a survey with our ID colleagues practicing in 10 cities in the country, we can see that the fungal diagnostic tests are concentrated in Metro Manila. All the cities surveyed would have pathologies that do histologic diagnosis of IFI and can do KOH and India Inc and where pathologies are present or available, diagnosis of IFI will be by histologic examination. Automated blood culture system, either BACTEC or BACTI alert are available in 10 cities that help in diagnosis of invasive candidiasis. VITEC for candida and cryptococcus species identification and antimicrobial susceptibility tests are available in seven cities. 
film array which can directly identify some candida species directly from blood culture bottle and cryptococcus from CSF is available in Metro Manila, Cebu, and Davao. Malditoc, which can more rapidly identify filamentous fungi from fungal culture isolate, the lactomannan assay, PCR, or immunofluorescent for pneumocystis are available in Metro Manila only. And we can, and uh, more recently, Sensitizer, a colometric growth microdilution technique that can be used for sensitivity testing of filamentous fungi isolated from fungal culture is available in St. Luke Medical Center. In 80% or, or a little less of the country, I surmise you know, there are probably no facilities for fungal diagnostics and even fungal cultures. Research on, them, on endemic as well of, on IFIs, considering that the population at risk for IFI exists in the country is needed. Despite our limited diagnostic tools, I'm sure it is possible to start with a database on IFIs in the country. Dr. Lagabayo kindly shared with me their data on the Lactomannan and on Candidinia, and I, and I told myself, here is a wealth of information where research can be done. What more if we have a database for the country? Despite our limited diagnostic tool, I'm sure it is possible to start with a database on IFIs in the country. As we continue to increase our efforts to provide quality training and laboratories in other areas outside Metro Manila, and with our growing and very vibrant young ID specialists spread out in many regions in the country, I'm sure we will be able to diagnose more clinically significant serious fungal infections in the country and provide treatment and do more research on IFIs in the country. Besides the diagnostic dilemmas we are facing, the other re reality we are confronted with is drug accessibility and affordability. Except for candidemia, most IFIs will require prolonged duration of treatment, and the cost of treatment is prohibitive, often resulting in no or incomplete treatment. We also have limited number of antifungal agents. Some antifungal agents, such as pasprofungin and posaconazole, have been pulled out of the market most likely because the pharma companies find only a small market, and this is mainly be because of its cost. We can see that lack of access to diagnostic mycology tests is a major gap in the diagnosis and management of IFI in the country. Despite new developments in the laboratory diagnosis of IFI, and considering the cost of new diagnostic techniques, Classic fungal culture continue to be relevant and necessary in the detection and identification of fungi. Fungal culture is affordable and in a resource limited country like ours will continue to play a role in the diagnosis of IFI. I hope that PSMID can take up the challenge of leading in the improvement in the diagnosis of IFI in the country by networking with institutions, universities like UP, USD that have mycology courses, by gathering together seasoned mycologists, the likes of Dr. Lagamayo and those in other hospitals to come up with a continuing program in medical mycology to expand the capability of laboratories in other regions in the identification of fungal pathogens. It is a fact that it will not be a priority program that the government will take on, though RITM is considered the National Reference Center in Mycology, considering the many more urgent public health issues they have to concern with. If we can bridge the gap in the laboratory diagnosis of mycology and support mycology training in and out of the country, and ID physicians being more available in many more regions in the country, 
we should be able to diagnose and successfully manage significantly more IFIs. And before I close, I'd like to say thank you to my colleagues in ID and microbiology, most especially Dr. Lagamayo, for very graciously uh, answering my queries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chua. We will now go to Dr. Mitsi Chua's lecture. Good morning. I will just um, share my screen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, congratulations to the organizing committee for coming up with a very innovative first time virtual convention. And also thank you for this opportunity to be able to share with you some learning points on this specific title, on this specific topic entitled biomarkers, don't confuse their use. <coughs> As previously mentioned, I am a member of the Asia Fungal Working Group, which is under the auspices of the ISHAM and a current ad board member of um, Pfizer antifungals, particularly this new antifungal that will hopefully reach our shores in two years' time, as well as industry-sponsored speaking engagements. This has been the learning objective that was given to me by the organizing committee to concisely discuss updates on the use of significant biomarkers in the diagnosis of invasive fungal infections with focus in the immunocompromised host. So let me be very um, academic in the first slide, defining what a biomarker is, because it got me thinking that it can really be a very broad term that may encompass even imaging techniques. And true enough, this is a 2001 definition from the Pharma Society that indicates that a biomarker is objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of normal biological processes, pathogenic or pharmacologic processes in response to a therapeutic intervention. And as I mentioned, um, it includes not only laboratory blood tests, but also other imaging techniques and even recordings of physiologic tests and be classified for its purposes of diagnosis, predictive value, prognosis, monitoring, and response and safety. In this context this morning, however, for invasive fungal infections or diseases, the need is for an alternative rapid test, which do not rely heavily so much in culture to get our diagnosis earlier. As mentioned by our first speaker, Dr. Chua also, um, she mentioned that um, the, the diagnosis locally heavily relies on cultures, but we know that it takes so much time to be able to do that. So allow me this next few slides to be able to discuss what the biomarkers that may be available, hopefully, in a broader local availability in the future. This is a table that would show some of these that have been elaborated and studied. And I think that I will be focusing only on about two of these due to um, local applicability. Having said that, let me start with the first biomarker, which is the 1,3-beta-D glucan or BDG. It is a cell wall glucose polysaccharide that detects a variety of clinically important fungi. However, it would also be good to point out that there are exceptions. And these include our Cryptococcus, Blastomyces, and the Mucoralis group, simply because they either lack this component in their cell wall or they produce it at minimal levels. So that what is applicable supposedly is that if we have the BDG test locally, we can supposedly easier identify our patients at risk of especially invasive candidiasis and inform an earlier decision to start antifungal therapy. BDG antigenemia, however, as stated in the body of evidence with this latest guideline from the 
European ID Society that came out in 2019 pointed out that detection of BDG or BDG antigenemia performs superiorly over risk prediction models and colonization indices, especially for predicting blood culture negative invasive candidiasis. So let me elaborate further. In the different studies that led to the recommendations of this guideline that I am alluding to, there has been heterogeneous diagnostic accuracy and that it best performs when used in high-risk populations. If you note, at the collated sensitivity and specificity, they vary a lot at 70 to 80 percent and 55 to 60 percent sensi spec respectively. However, as mentioned, this test has a negative predictive value that is or can be optimized. As mentioned, there is a high um, reliability in terms of usage if we want to be able to detect the blood culture negative invasive candidiasis, whether it is present or not. And so the recommendation is that it is best used with risk prediction models or in fact in conjunction with the use of the other fungal biomarkers. I would like to share this review on BDG testing which came out also in just uh, published this year on the detection of invasive fungal infections in the immunocompromised or critically ill, for which we have case studies later um, in this workshop. So this review compared the diagnostic accuracy of commercially available BDG tests using serum sample to detect selective invasive fungal infections among the immunocompromised or critically ill. This review generated 49 studies with over 6,000 participants and about half of all the studies collected or collated involved people with cancer or hematologic malignancies. 73% focused on the brand Fungitel BDG test. I'd like to ask um, Dr. Lagamaya later if this is the one that is available in St. Luke's as to the brand or the kit that is used. Um, these studies were in the majority either prospective or retrospective consecutive study design, but the researchers um, noted that there was considerable difference in the sensitivity and specificity between studies so that it is not possible to estimate the diagnostic accuracy in specific settings. So further studies estimating the accuracy of BDG tests should be linked to the way it is used in clinical practice, should be clearly described as to the sampling protocol and the relationship of the time of testing to the time of diagnosis. So unfortunately, there is really not a very um, clear-cut conclusion as to the generalizability of how to use this BDG testing. Sharing with you another article or an editorial on biomarker-guided antifungal therapy, particularly for invasive candidiasis, the conclusion is that there is a need to clearly define populations for which it is cost-effective to do serial measurement of these fungal biomarkers. And these should be performed so that there can be early withdrawal of empirically, empirically started antifungal treatment, or on one hand, early detection of an IFI and decide who to put on preemptive treatment. So this brings us to the four phases of or approaches of antifungal therapy, which are prophylactic, preemptive, um, empiric, and definitive. And as mentioned, the biomarkers play a major role in so far as preemptive is concerned or in the context of stewardship when we would want to streamline or in fact stop empirically started antifungal treatment if there is no evidence of infection. So the antifungal sparing strategy supposedly would lead to better allocation of treatment and of course the final outcomes of better patient outcomes clinically cost economic, economics and avoided ecologic damages brought about by resistance through widespread and indiscriminate use of antifungals. So a good clinical scenario that was cited in this editorial was using the serial measurements to guide for preemptive initiation, specifically for high-risk population, 
such as those with severe pancreatitis or patients who underwent major abdominal surgery. Again, the desired outcome would still be the decrease in the number of patients unnecessarily exposed to the antifungal treatment. Switching gears to the other biomarker in focus for this morning is galactomannan. Galactomannan, on the other hand, is a cell wall polysaccharide that is released from the hyphae of aspergillus species and can be found in other body fluids and other fungi as well. There have been US FDA approved immunoassays and as mentioned also by Dr. Jen Chua earlier, the diagnostic is available only in large centers in Manila. We don't have it here in uh, Cebu, which is in the Visayas. So sharing again another review, this time on galactomannan, and the focus is on optimized detection so that the recommended specimen is respiratory, particularly bronchoalveolar lavage. Again, this brings us to another challenge if we are really able to do bronchoscopy in these immunocompromised patients. In this review that was published in 2019, the objective was to assess the diagnostic accuracy of GM in BAL, bronchoalveolar lavage, for the diagnosis of invasive aspergillosis in people who are immunocompromised. 17 cohort studies were collated using the European classifications as reference standard for criterion-based um, definition of the infections. But the once again, the populations and results were very heterogeneous. And the authors concluded that the optimal cutoff for the galactomannan level, which should be most helpful for diagnosis, depends on the local incidence and clinical pathway. Please allow me to indulge on this um, elaboration. So at a prevalence, for example, of 12% with a hypothetical population of 1,000, it would mean that there are 120 patients with invasive aspergillosis. At a cutoff of 0.514, Patients with IA will be missed, and there will be 167 patients incorrectly diagnosed with invasive aspergillosis. If the cutoff is adjusted to one, we would have missed 26 patients with IA, and there will be 62 who are incorrectly diagnosed with invasive aspergillosis. So that interpretation and extrapolation of these results have to be performed with caution, and from these hypothetical data, a test result of 1.5 or higher appears to be the strongest indicator of IA, which brings us to another challenge that it is not just making locally available this test in our midst, but we also need the strong arm of our clinical um, laboratory to work hand in hand with us in looking at the local um, performance of this diagnostic. And we know that these biomarkers also do come at a cost. We know that they somehow mirror the cost of cultures. And if we look into the premise of getting serial measurements, then that would really mean a lot of added cost for the patient. And then we have to look at how reliable these tests are. The other fungal biomarkers that have been mentioned in the literature, but to my knowledge, it's not also available here locally, are the Manan antigen and anti-Manan antibody. Although preliminary um, reviews show that it has suboptimal performance. And then the candida species germ tube antibody, which also is reported to have low sensitivity and specificity. I am not sure in your centers, but um, we still do the conventional germ tube testing um, for our candida species in our local labs. And then looking into future directions for research, these are two examples of metabolites that um, hopefully in the future would prove to be more reliable or more sensitive in diagnosing our fungal infections. So can bio biomarkers at this point really improve IFD management? In this prospective study, in a mixed specialty critical care unit, and which I found to be um, a setting that we can actually relate to, which was done um, three, approximately three years ago, this observational study investigated a set of biomarkers of IFD in 
23 bed capacity ICU in Ireland. The patients receive critical care or were in the ICU for at least one week and serum samples were tested for all these. So we have our BDG and GM, which we discussed earlier, Aspergillus fumigatus DNA, and GM antigen detection on the bowel samples. This is the demographic data of the patients studied, and they had a subset of patients with proven and probable IFD at 33, and the other with possible IFD or those with only colonization. Again, just looking at eyeballing at the numbers, they actually mirror at what we see, that most of those definitively diagnosed come at the smaller percentage or minority compared to those for which we actually suspect or do empiric treatment or are simply colonized. So the study results from this Ireland research showed that in patients with proven and probable IFD, for one positive BDG, the sensitivity is quite low at 63%. The negative predictive value is 83%. And the specificity increased to 86% if serial or at least two consecutive positive results of BDG were done. So the mean BDG value of patients with proven and probable IFD were also noted to be higher compared to group 2, which I pointed out to be the patients only with fungal colonization and no evidence of active infection. The conclusion from the authors of this study is that new diagnostic criteria incorporating these biomarkers, particularly BDG, as well as host factors unique to critical care patients, should enhance IFD diagnosis to positively impact our antifungal stewardship programs. So at this point, it seems that it's not a black and white thing through all my discussion and sharing of the current literature on these fungal biomarkers. This I would like to share, and I actually share this also in a past um, lecture on IFD, is helpful in the sense that we are able to mix in clinical criteria and the laboratory parameters that may be available. So this is, however, not for the immunocompromised neutropenic patient, but for the subset of patients that we see in our ICUs. So the question begins with, does the patient have abdominal sepsis? And if no, is candidemia more, what is the likelihood rather of candidemia more than invasive candidiasis? And then we can combine, as mentioned, the predict prediction rules or the scoring systems for the likelihood as well as work up for other infections and alternative diagnosis. And here, if we have the availability of our beta D glucan or other biomarkers to help us decide if there is really a need for empiric antifungal treatment, and we know for which for invasive candidiasis, the, can the echinocandins are recommended as the first line for these critically ill non-neutropenic patients. Looking at the left side if abdominal sepsis is highly suspected and invasive candidiasis is high risk therefore at more than 10 to 15 percent then antifungal therapy is indicated at early on in this algorithm and the usage of the biomarker is more on monitoring response to therapy now let me switch my final gear to procalcitonin. We know that procalcitonin has been um, with us locally and it's something that uh, we can now readily order, although it also comes as a cause that would somehow mirror a blood culture. But there has been a um, question of its usefulness in the cases of candidiasis. And this is so far the, the latest or most recent review that I could get way back in 2019 wherein procalcitonin levels were compared for candidemia versus bacteremia. So the objective was to see if these patients, both ICU and non-ICU, will have a specific guidance on cutoff levels. Among 16 studies from 45,000 patients and 785 cases of candidemia, all of these were retrospective except for one with secondary analysis of a prospective data set. However, again, the data were very, very heterogeneous and had different assessment methods. Most studies, however, showed lower 
procalcitonin values in patients with candidemia compared to bacteremia. However, these were based on low quality evidence and at this time, at this point, it is insufficient to discriminate a particular level of procalcitonin to differentiate candidemia versus bacteremia. There is so much more to learn with how um, procalcitonin can be used since, as I've said, it's readily available. And this is just one example of a response to that research or that review that I showed to you earlier. This uh, was a pilot study done in an ICU to look at the combination of procalcitonin and another inflammatory marker, which is CRP. And based on this pilot, very preliminary study, it seems that the predictive ability of differentiating candidemia from bacteremia was improved with the combination. Again, no direct answers for this morning. And that is why this brings me to my last slide. Allow me to give you a corny mushroom joke, but it actually is very appropriate to my final message. Um, we're not always in the dark, but it seems that I, I hope I was not confusing in the last few minutes of the session, but I don't think it was as enlightening in terms of wanting black and white answers in so far as IFI is concerned. But we do have so much room to learn. It is just that a lot of research gaps abound in the practice of medical mycology. So there is so much room to challenge to be able to fill those gaps. And as always, while there are gaps, we keep going. And the best room is always for best practices. So our individualized clinical assessment per patient, of course, prompt cultures before start of antifungals, the availability of diagnostics can be optimized depending on our setting, of course, looking into cost economics as well, and treating the patient and not the laboratories. With that, I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Mitsushiwa. Let us now go ahead with Dr. Jackson research. Okay, I hope my, my audio is good. I'll try to share my screen right now. So thank you very much to PSMID for the invitation uh, for me to be able to share uh, insights about radiologic imaging of fungal infection. So my topic for today would be radiologic imaging of fungal infection, its manifestations and the modalities that can be used in detecting fungal infections. Uh, there's nothing that I'll be disclosing for this lecture. So the learning objectives for this morning would be a general overview of fungal infections. I'll be also discussing imaging features of fungal infections and the appropriate imaging modalities that, that can be used in aiding the investigation of such an infection. There are around 5,000 species of fungi, of, of fungal infection in the fungi kingdom, and 200 of these are human pathogens and a, and a couple dozen causes 90% of the human fungal infections. The incidence is increasing due to the rising numbers of immunocompromised patients, especially those presenting with neutropenia, those with HIV, those who are in chronic immunosuppression, those patients with indwelling prosthesis who had burns, diabetic patients, and in decrease, in the increased use of broad spectrum antibiotics. This is an infection that we considered uh, affecting from head to toe. And we can classify fungal infection basically to an invasive type or a secondary pathogen. An invasive pathogen would be true pathogens and inherently virulent. And these are the examples of uh, fun fungal infections that are invasive, such as histoplasma, coccidiosis, blastomyces. And for secondary pathogens, we have candida aspergillus and cryptococcus. This, are, this is a table uh, that would present the different uh, system that, is in, that can be infected by fungal infections and its manif uh, clinical manifestations and the organisms that are usually involved 
and the patients who are also uh, prone to having these types of infections. So for imaging of fungal infection, clinical history is very relevant. I would admit that in imaging, uh, we are also underdiagnosing most of the fungal infections simply because of a poor clinical history that is being uh, accompanied by the uh, imaging request. So what is basically the role of imaging? So the role of imaging is not really to determine as to what type of fungal infection is really affecting the patient, but it's really more of evaluating the disease activity and the disease extent and the therapy response of the patient and the related complications that is not clinically seen. So imaging is usually done based on organ manifestation, meaning it can affect the brain. So we do imaging of the brain. And if it affects other organs, then we do uh, imaging of that organ involved. So from head to toe, uh, fungal infection would have preferences in the brain, sinuses, bones, and the uh, gastrointestinal tract. So what I'll try to do this morning is to discuss the different imaging findings of fungal infection affecting the brain, the paranasal sinuses, uh, the uh, chest or the thoracic region, the gastrointestinal tract, and I'll be also dealing with uh, a little bit with the liver and the spleen, and also of the bones. So neuroimaging in fungal infection, it occurs most frequently in immunosuppressed patients especially in endemic areas. So patients who are prone to have fungal infections are those with neutropenia and HIV. And usually these patients would present with neurologic deficits. The route of infections are usually through direct extension or through the hematogenous, or, uh, hematogenous route. Most common fungal infection involve are candida and aspergillus, uh, including cryptococcus also and mucoralis. So most common CNS findings for fungal infection would be meningitis for the species of candida and C. neoformans. Cerebral abscesses and granulomas are also some of the imaging findings that we could see for fungal infection. And in certain cases, we could also uh, see uh, mycotic aneurysms affecting the intracranial vessels. So non-contrast imaging would usually show uh, subtle signs of hydrocephalus in the form of dilated temporal horns of the lateral ventricles. And with contrast imaging, uh, MR is much, much better compared to computed tomography. Uh, it would exhibit the thick meningeal enhancement. Also, uh, it would be able to describe as to what type of meningeal enhancement uh, we are uh, seeing, whether this is nodular or smooth with the nodular leptomeningeal enhancement favoring fungal infection. But again, it cannot be easily differentiated from carcinomatosis or granulomatous infection. So for uh, other findings that we could see uh, with regards to fungal infection in the brain would be the uh, presence of mycotic aneurysm. This is typically and usually of the fusiform type. It involves the proximal vasculature specifically the area of the circle of Willis, and in difference from, uh, from the congenital or acquired type of aneurysm, which are usually of saccular type and in areas of vascular bif bifurcation. Uh, presence of mycotic aneurysm may result to intracerebral hemorrhage, which may then uh, cause uh, severe uh, deterioration of the patient. Other findings that can be seen with intracranial uh, fungal infection would be granuloma, abscesses, and presence of gelatinous pseudocysts. Uh, organisms that are usually associated with granuloma are aspergillus, mucoroles, and C. uniformans. Abscesses are also very common with fungal infections and presents with dream enhancing lesions with or without vasogenic edema. Uh, it usually exhibits fluid restriction signals in MR, and therefore uh, MR is very useful and very sensitive in finding uh, these lesions. However, this uh, finding is not uh, pathognomonic of uh, fungal infection, but can also be seen with biogenic abscesses. Gelatinous pseudocysts is usually identified in the deep perivascular spaces 
it usually follows the, the penetrating vessels and usually uh, seen in the area of the basal ganglia and the thalami. And it causes the vacuolation with increased gelat gelatinous accumulation of the fluid within these vacuoles. So this is a sample image of leptomeningeal uh, enhancement related to a fungal infection. Arrows are pointing to a non-contrast flare image wherein we have subtle signs of hydrocephalus in the form of dilated temporal horns with some abnormal signals along the leptomeninges or the cortical sulci of the brain. Post-contrast T1 weighted image shows clearly the increased enhancement along the cerebellar folia as well as presence of enhancement along the basal cisterns. Again, what would differentiate a uh, fungal infection from a pyogenic abscess, uh, pyogenic leptomeningeal, uh, leptomeningitis would be the appearance of nodular leptomeningeal enhancement as against to a more smooth leptomeningeal enhancement seen with a pyogenic infection. Again, as I mentioned earlier, a mimic of uh, a nodular type of leptomeningeal enhancement would be secondary to a granulomatous infection. As seen in this case, we see some nodular components enhancing along the leptomeninges of this patient. Another finding of significance for patients uh, uh, with fungal infection of the brain or in would be the presence of mycotic aneurysm. And in this case, we could see accumulation of blood within the sylvian fissure in the right side and the aneurysm along the area of the bifurcation of the middle cerebral artery also on the right side. Uh, this patient was proven to have uh, uh, fungal infection uh, post-mortem. So brain abscesses are also very common among fungal uh, infections in uh, among fungal infections of the brain and MRI is the best uh, imaging modality that is available right now that is able to differentiate fungal infections as against uh, tumors in the brains uh, simply with the use of one sequence which is uh, the diffusion weighted image as presented in these two slides here we could see that the two lesions that we're seeing here exhibits increased restricted fluid uh, motion, which is correlated or very, very uh, specific for uh, brain abscesses. Other than that, we see the usual presentation of brain abscesses, which is rim enhancing, uh, which is in the form of very, very smooth rim enhancement as against the tumors, which are uh, otherwise very rugged. Pseudocyst formation is also one of the manifestations of fungal infections. This is presented as T2-weighted hyperintense uh, signals, uh, and, the and the usual pattern would be cysts in clusters located in the basal ganglia. So for imaging modalities, especially for, for neuroimaging uh, for fungal infections, the in initial imaging tool that is being used is a non-contrast CT scan. And this is to determine we have hydrocephalus, which is related to leptomeningitis, and also the presence of cerebral hemorrhage and ischemic infarctions, which are also very common with infections of the brain. However, the pre preferred imaging tool uh, for uh, fungal infections of the brain would be a contrast enhanced MRI. Aside from diagnosing the presence of hydrocephalus, it would better depict even the subtle signs of leptomeningeal enhancement, it would also be able to determine whether vasculitis, aneurysm, hemorrhage, or ischemic infarctions are present. Now we go to head and neck imaging in fungal infection. Now it usually affects the paranasal sinuses. Uh, what's unfortunate about this one, this is a relatively progressive infection and very rapid and with a high mortality of around 18%. 93% of the infections are, are usually seen with, uh, uh, with patients uh, having uh, malignancy of the uh, head and neck region. Diabetes is a predisposing factor and the common pathogens would be psychomyces, rhizophus, rhizomucor, and aspergillus for neutropenic patients. Fungal infections in the paranasal sinuses can also mimic that of a bacterial infection. And in certain cases, it can also mimic 
uh, findings of uh, tumors in the paranasal sinuses. Uh, fungal infections are locally invasive. However, it also causes osseous destruction, including the soft tissues, and can invade the pterygopalatine fossa, the cavernous sinuses, and also that of the intracranial cavity. This is one image or one uh, example of a case where in a fungal infection, which is a mycetoma in this case, which is a little bit uh, quiescent or not really that aggressive, wherein we see an infection of the right maxillary sinus opacified with a little of calcification within. So this is the bone window of the same patient showing you the faint calcification. And with the use of MR, we're able to differentiate the area of mucosal inflammation as against to the area where the fungal infection is. Another image which shows the gravity of a fungal infection affecting the, uh, the, the paranasal sinuses. Again, we see the inflammation or infection of the right maxillary sinus. This time it extends beyond the, 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 maxillary, uh, the, the right maxillary sinus and extends to the right nasal cavity as well as into the extraconal space of the right orbit, causing bony erosion of the right lamina parparisea, as well as the osseous structures within the uh, right nasal cavity. Another imaging which shows how uh, fungal infection of the sinonasal area is uh, shown to be very aggressive. This time it affects the area of the right orbit causing proptosis of the right orbit as well as that of the right cavernous sinus. So for imaging of the uh, sinonasal uh, area for fungal infection, the initial imaging tool is usually a CT scan. It shows you whether there is osseous destruction or none. It would also tell you whether you have mucosal inflammation also shows you whether there is any suspicious soft tissue feeling defect that would suspect us to have fungal infection within the sinuses. And it can also show extra sinonasal involvement. Contrast enhanced MR would also show you the same findings except that it is more superior to uh, CT scan when it comes to the imaging. Uh, preferred imaging tool for, for uh, uh, looking at the paranasal sinuses for fungal infection. If we're looking for uh, osseous involvement or if we would want to look at the extent of uh, osseous in, uh, destruction, then we use a non-contrast CT for this one. But if we would want to look at the overall extent of the, the, the infection, whether it has involved the intracranial areas or not, then a contrast MRI is the one recommended. For thoracic imaging and fungal infection, lung is a frequent site of first contact with the environment for fungal antigens. Uh, invasive fungal infections are frequently diagnosed with the use of uh, conventional radiography or, or CT scan. Uh, a wide spectrum of radiologic findings can be seen uh, in terms of fungal infection and can range from a simple pulmonary nodule to lobar consolidation. Other ancillary findings that one can see would be presence of lymph adenopathy or pleural effusion. And usually there's overlapping findings amongst the different fungal infections as well as other lung infections. So fungal infection can be classified whether they are angio-invasive or airway invasive as they would present differently in CT scan or in chest radiograph. So for angio-invasive fungal pneumonias, the manifestation would be usually in the form of pulmonary nodules or consolidation, and it is usually surrounded by ground glass opacities seen best in CT, which we call as a CT halo sign. So for, for these types of findings, uh, the uh, pathogen would be aspergillosis, candida, and C immunities, and C neoformans. We also have a, a so-called reverse halo sign where in the ground glass opacity is seen surrounded by consolidation and it is usually associated with mucor mycosis. Other radiologic findings that we would see with uh, an angio-invasive fungal pneumonias would be cavitation, pulmonary infarction, which is located peripheral to the nodules. 
On the other hand, airway invasive fungal infection would manifest as peribronchial consolidation with three in bud nodules. Uh, pathogens would include blastomycosis, histoplasma, C. neoformans, coccidiomycosis, and mucormycosis. Blastomycosis can mimic tuberculosis in its uh, uh, imaging findings in the lungs. Usually, it presents with central consolidation, which abuts the mediastinum. Uh, nodules tend to calcify, and usually these patients would have skin findings. Uh, however, blastomycosis is usually located only in the Great Lakes of the United States. Histoplasmosis, on the other hand, commonly is a self-limiting pulmonary infection, and usually what we see in imaging are the sequelae of the infection, which is in the form of calcified pulmonary granulomas. However, if seen in the acute stage, it can present as consolidation with lymphadenopathy, which is a very nonspecific finding. If it is disseminated, it would present as a miliary type form, which is almost similar also to tuberculosis. However, this is no, not associated with plural, plural effusion. Coccidiomycosis, on the other hand, is also geographical, also in location, uh, seen most commonly in the southwest western United States. Manifestation is more of plural effusion uh, with uh, multilobar consolidation, and the consolid consolidations affecting these patients usually disappears and reappears in another location. Lymphadenopathy is also very common with coccidiomycosis, and if it's disseminated, it would also present similar to histoplasmosis. Mucormycosis, on the other hand, is usually seen as an area of consolidation, but it cavitates, uh, uh, similar to what is seen with actinomyces and nocardia. It also involves the pleural and the chest wall and may produce empyema. Pneumocystis gerovici, sorry for that one, usually presents with ground glass opacity with crazy paving appearance. And the CT imaging features are very typical and distinct from other fungal new, uh, pneumonias. Plural effusion is not common. However, in the chronic form, what we would be able to see is only the presence of lung stage uh, uh, replacing the areas of ground glass opacities. Now we go through the different images, okay, that we would be able to see with regards to fungal infection of the lungs. This is an example of pulmonary aspergilloma, which can be detected using simple conventional radiography. We have a pulmonary mass in the right upper and the left upper lobe, which shows uh, signs of cavitation. A magnification of the same area would show you the cystic lucency within the area of the uh, lung nodule. Uh, differential diagnosis for this case, if the patient is also a smoker, would be a squamous type or a small cell type of carcinoma, which are also known to produce cavitating nodules. And then this is a, uh, an example of an angioinvasive aspergillosis infection. We see an area of consolidation, areas of cystic lucencies probably representing areas of uh, necrosis within the area of consolidation. What is uh, of note here is the presence of these ground glass opacities surrounding the area of consolidation, producing the so-called CT halo sign, okay, favoring, the, uh, favoring an infection more than a tumor. This is another type of uh, lung infection of aspergillosis we see here an area of consolidation, this time associated with a area of uh, cavitation within, as seen by a sleeve of air, okay, within the area of consolidation, not conforming with any of the bronchial airways. And this is a suggestive uh, finding of aspergillosis, pulmonary aspergillosis. Airway invasive type of fungal infection would present usually with consolidation. You would see also some centrilobular nodules very uh, adjacent to this area of consolidation. The consolidation findings is very nonspecific and can also be seen in cases of other infections. Now we go 
uh, with another N airway invasive uh, fungal infection, which is uh, pneumocystis, which is very, very quite unique uh, for this uh, type of fungal infection where it, it presents usually with ground glass opacities. It can be patchy, it can be very diffuse. And in this case, the area of ground glass opacities is very diffusely uh, involving both lungs. Now, imaging modalities for thoracic uh, fungal infection. Initial imaging tool usually would be a, a conventional chest radiograph. It would determine whether we have an infection or not, presence of consolidation or cavitary lesion, with which, which lead us to the impression of aspergilloma. However, the preferred imaging tool would be a contrast-enhanced CT. It would detect early changes in the lungs. It would also show us ground glass opacities which is not seen with uh, the conventional chest radiograph. It allows us also better comparison of images, Im images in terms of disease progression or regression. Uh, MRI has poor resolution when it comes to the lung parenchyma and usually is unable to see ground glass opacities. We are hearing right now the use of ultrasound in thoracic imaging. However, the use of ultrasound uh, in thoracic imaging is limited and it's usually is able to see only peripheral lesions and the presence of pleural effusion. However, to see uh, the ground glass opacities is almost impossible. And the ultrasound procedure is usually a long scanning time uh, giving us with uh, limited information. Now we go to the gastrointestinal imaging for fungal infection. Uh, fungal infection can affect the visceral organs of the abdomen uh, and includes the, also the GIT and the hepatobiliary tract. GIT fungal involvement is rare and usually seen in, in immunocompromised patients. And the imaging findings are very nonspecific and uh, presents as bowel wall thickening with adjacent mesenteric inflammation. And in certain cases where in patients with indwelling catheters, uh, peritonitis would also be one of the uh, findings that can be seen with fungal infection. So for hepatic or splenic fungal infections, usually this is due to hematogenous seeding of the infection. Most common pathogen would be still candida. Patients would be presenting with uh, systemic symptoms, which is very, very uh, uh, not really uh, what we call as not something which is uh, unusual, which is fever, malaise, and abdominal pain. Me imaging would be showing us multiple micro abscesses of less than one centimeter in size and usually would appear in miliary pattern. Ultrasound would be able to detect, detect four distinct patterns for hepatic candidiasis and these are both eye appearance wherein there's a central echogenic focus surrounded by a peripheral hypoechoic halo. A wheel within a wheel configuration would also give us suspicion for a, a micro abscesses, uh, which shows as a peripheral hypoechoic ring surrounded by echogenic ring, which in turn is surrounded also by another hypoechoic center. It can also present with a, a hypoechoic nodule, which is again is a very non-specific finding or a, an echogenic focus, which is a sequelae of the infection itself. This is a CT scan of a patient uh, afflicted with a fungal infection, which manifests as uh, thickening of the gastrointestinal tract, which is, in this case, the small intestines surrounded by mesenteric fat stranding and thickening of the mesentery. Hepatic candidiasis in CT would appear as round rim enhancing nodular lesions. And in this case, patient is post mortem, we see the appearance of hepatic candidiasis. This is a case where in the spleen is now involved by the candida. We have one rim enhancing nodule in the spleen and several in the liver. In MRI, what we could see are subtle signs of T2 hyperintense uh, nodules, which upon the administration of intravenous contrast would be enhancing similarly to what is seen in CT scan. In ultrasound, this is the bullseye appearance wherein we have a hypoechoic center 
surrounded by a hypogenic uh, peripheral rim. And the sequelae of the infection would appear as echogenic foci or calcified lesions in ultrasound. So the preferred imaging uh, for uh, abdominal or gastrointestinal or uh, fungal infection, uh, general abdominal imaging would be a contrast enhanced CT or MR with negative oral contrast. It would be the preferred if we're going to evaluate the liver, spleen, and the gastrointestinal tract. But if we're interested with the gastrointestinal tract, then the contrast CT or MR with negative oral contrast would also suffice. But if we're just looking for visceral organs, like the, the, the liver and the spleen, an ultrasound would be more than enough. So ultrasound would be a good imaging modality for the visceral organs, like the liver, spleen, and kidneys. Not recommended for the uh, evaluation of the gastrointestinal tract, as the bowel gas obscures these structures. Contrast-enhanced CT and MR would be uh, the imaging uh, preferred imaging tool uh, for this case. Now we go to the last topic, which is bone fungal infection. So fungal infection can affect not only the bones, but also the joints. It, it, it results from the direct inoculation, contiguous infection spread, or hematogenous seeding of the organism. So most common offending organisms are, again, Candida and Aspergillus, okay? For Candida, the vertebral osteomyelitis, if seen, uh, is considered to be the most common location for this kind of infection, but it can also affect the femoral and humeral bones, especially in pediatric patients. For aspergillus infection of the vertebral bodies and ribs, uh, these are the most frequent sites where these kinds of uh, fungal infections would occur. Uh, imaging findings for, for fungal infection of the bones and joints are also nonspecific and can overlap with bacterial type of infection. So here we see an, an uh, a lytic change within the medulla of the uh, distal tibia, tibial metaphysis, and a uh, image which is enlarged shows the lytic lesion. Again, with the use of conventional radiography, one would be able to see changes related to uh, an osteomyelitis. However, this finding is a little bit late because there is already certain changes within the bone, which we do not want really to occur. Uh, and we would want to see the infection prior to uh, it being involving the bones in such a ways. So with the use of MR, uh, one would be able to see early changes with regards to osteomyelitis. It would also tell you the extent of the infection, not only of the bones, but also of the surrounding soft tissues. Like in this case, we see changes also in the periosteum and the subcutaneous tissue. So preferred imaging for bone infections would be a contrast NMRI and uh, followed by conventional radiography. And bone scan would also, uh, ha would also have a role in terms of uh, imaging bone infections. So in summary, we have reviewed uh, fungal infections the general imaging features of fungal infections from brain to bones. We also have seen, uh, reviewed the specific features of certain fungal infections, especially uh, in the lungs. And we have the reviewed the preferred imaging modalities for the different sites of fungal infections, including the strong and weak points of the different imaging modalities currently available. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jackson Lee. We appreciate that extensive and informative lecture. We now go to Dr. Evelina Lagamaya.
Hello. I'm. I uh, how. Yeah. I'm going to. I. Stop share. I cannot go to my desktop. Uh, PowerPoint. on the slideshow. Tara? Yes. Yes, you can go ahead. Okay. Good morning.
Hello, good morning. I'm going to uh, I'm going to discuss with you the following objectives this morning: the histopathologic diagnosis of invasive fungal diseases, to give the clues uh, or the signs of invasive fungal pathogens in histopathologic exam, and to give the clues or evidence in the diagnosis of uh, infectious fungal infection to enumerate the modern trend in the diagnosis of IFD. So there are six major ways that fungi grow in tissues. We have the hypha, you can see uh, the yeast cells, the granules, the spherules, patient bodies, yeast cells, and hyphae. For the granules, it is usually seen in subcutaneous tissue like um, mycetoma so we will not discuss that anymore uh, because we are dealing with infect with invasive fungal infection so for the hyphae uh, the most common pathogens would be the aspergillus and the uh, rhizopus, rhizopus uh, species and absidia which belongs to the uh, group of pycomyces so dichotomous for Aspergillus species, it is dichotomously branch, as you see on the uh, middle picture with the arrow, that is a 45 degree septate, um, uh, the hyphae, and it could be, and for the rhizopus, a group of phycomycetes or pycomyces, it is sinusitic, which means it is non-septate. And uh, it measures about five to eight microns in diameter, usually occurs at right angle. Now in mycosis, uh, this is caused by this uh, fungi, namely the absidia, corymbifera, and the rhizopus and mucor species. So we can see here the histopathologic appearance of, of the uh, filamentous fungi uh, elements which is non-septate and we can also hear the calcoplore stain we have already also the uh, MRI of uh, rhinocerebral um, mucomycosis caused by apophis pisomyces elegans and this is the clinical picture mucormycosis is mainly rhinocerebral but also can be pulmonary gastrointestinal or disseminated infection caused by molds belonging to the uh, group of mucor mucoralis. And these are the other list of uh, pathogens belonging to uh, the mucor species. Now we go to the yeast cells. It could be small cells that are uh, two to four microns in diameter. It could be intracellular and typical. This, when we see these structures, we think of histoplasma capsulatum. When we see encapsulated yeast, this is the I, the, I remember Dr. Balmer telling us that the only pathogenic encapsulated yeast is Cryptococcus neoformans. Now, when we see a broad-based yeast in tissues, we, we think of Blastomyces dermatitidis. When we see a, multiple buds in a parent, ce parent cell, we think of Paracoxidioides brasiliensis. And when we see yeast with binary fission, we think of Penicillium marnefii, now called Talaromyces marnefii. So let me show you this, some pictures of the culture uh, of the organism here at 37 degrees centigrade, which is in yeast form after one to three weeks incubation on brain heart infusion agar. And after incubation with this growth, we do a lactophenol cotton blue smear and we'll see the oval or round shape, about two to four microns yeast or small yeast of histoplasma capsulatum. And since this is dimorphic, when we incubate it at room temperature, it will form tuberculate um, macroconidia, as you see here on the, on the right side. Microscopically in tissues, with an HNE stain, we would appreciate the intracellular yeast measuring about two to five microns of histoplasma capsulatum. And in lung tissue, when we stain it, we stain it with methanamine silver stain, 
we could see the same small intracellular yeast. When we use uh, calcofluor stain in sputum, we will be able to see the fluorescence of these small budding yeasts. Clinically, it, it presents as a muco mucosal ulcer in patients with histoplasmosis and of course some pulmonary uh, symptoms. And this is uh, other pictures of histoplasma capsulatum, the conidia that is tuberculate, um, macroconidia. When we do a smear in a patient with histoplasmosis, we may be able to see in the peripheral blood the intracellular yeast inside, as you can see here in, the, in this um, neutrophil. Now, another yeast that is pathogenic, we have the Cryptococcus neoformans. And when we see, we see it under uh, the microscope with methenamine silver, uh, this is a lung, bio, lung biopsy, we could see the dark colored large yeast cells. With mucor mucicarmine stain, it's, uh, it stains the polysaccharide capsule of the, of the fungus and we would be able to appreciate the red uh, colored uh, stained pathogen. With an HNE stain, we can also appreciate the capsulated form of the yeast. Now, cryptococcosis is uh, caused by cryptococcus neoformans, and most of this infection occurs in immunocompromised patients, especially those with AIDS. Meningitis is the most common clinical presentation. Another picture of the colony, which is doughy, like a condensed milk. When you tilt it, the colonies will flow down. That is one clue that uh, we that is it, this is a Cryptococcus neoformans. And of course, the MRI uh, picture, as discussed by Dr. D earlier, and with the CSF exam, we, using the Inja ink, we can clearly appreciate the capsulated yeast. Although blastomyces dermatitis is not commonly seen in the Philippines because of travel history, uh, we may be able to see one once they are exposed in other countries. And the microscopic appearance of the organism would be like this one, uh, difficult to identify. You'll just see uh, hyphal elements with some small yeast cells. And this is the clinical picture of the cutaneous blastomycosis. Uh, on the right is the microscopic picture of the uh, broad-based. That is one clue. It is broad-based budding yeast, a parent and a daughter cell. Another uh, picture here of the histopathologic uh, uh, section showing numerous yeast cells, budding yeast, which is characterized by broad based budding yeast. Just, I, I usually tell my students as, as it looks like a snowman. So this one is another bigger parent cell and a smaller daughter cell. It measures about 8 to 15 microns in diameter. Now with paracoxidioidomycosis, we have this microscopic appearance um, here. Not, not so beautiful, but with a histopath uh, section, we can see the uh, multiple budding yeast, uh, parent a parent cell and multiple daughter cells around it. So since the organism is also dimorphic, we can see in the culture the yeast cells or the yeast form and in the at room temperature the uh, filamentous form. This is the oral lesion in paracoxidioidomycosis. Now, in, in the form of spherules, we see in a cross section here of the lung stained with H and E stain, we see the spherules with uh, endospores inside it. It measures up to 60 microns in diameter. That is coccidioides imitis. In contrast with rhinosporidium species, it is very big it can measure up to 300 microns in diameter. And this is usually a causes subcutaneous infection. 
So with coccygeidomycosis, this is the microscopic appearance showing us the arthrospores. This is the growth when we when we uh, grow it in the in, in the laboratory, and this is highly infectious. It needs a very strict containment in the lab because it is airborne and can easily infect. This is the cross section of the uh, spherules with endospores with methanamine silver stain. And the other picture here is uh, histopath findings of spherules in patients with coccidioidomycosis. This is a clinical picture of coccidioidomycosis manifestation with erythema multiforme in a patient with pul primary pulmonary coccidioidomycosis. So the next form is the fission bodies uh, commonly seen in chromatoblastomycosis, and it is usually caused by dematiaceous fungi. It has no buds, no hyphae, just pigmented fungi. And we call this sclerotic uh, cells or sclerotic bodies. Another form would be the yeast cells with hyphae, and this is uh, the uh, The yeast cells with hyphae, these are the uh, growth uh, on culture, SDA. This one is uh, with a methanamine silver stain in the cross section of the lung. And this one is the, the yeast cells and the budding yeast and the hypha, which is very characteristic of candida. In deep candidos candidosis, we see the microscopic appearance of the uh, Budding yeast, here it is in clusters with the pseudohyphae in the CSF. This one is uh, with just a plain gram stain in urine sample. And this one is the gross pathology of the liver with candida albicans infection. And another one is the radiographic appearance in a hepatosplenic candidosis. So this is another picture of the kidney we're in. Uh, this is infected with miliary abscesses due to candida species. Take note of the necrotic papillae. Now in esophagus section, we see the vascular invasion of the blastoconidia and pseudohypha of candida species using PAS stain, very clearly seen with PAS stain. So now we go to other opportunistic pathogens such as aspergillus species. Uh, under the microscope, we can see with the um, methanamine silver stain, we can see the branching hyphae at 45 degrees or dichotomous branching. Now, this one is the invasive uh, view of the liver, which is infected with the candida, or with aspergillus species, rather. This is the culture. Uh, typically, it is velvety in, in, in uh, consistency and usually green in color and when we do the lactophenol uh, cotton blue smear we can appreciate the typical uh, appearance of aspergillus uh, which is we call it the fruiting head now with pneumocystis gerovecci this is a uh, formerly known as pneumocystis carini this causes uh, usually it is manifested as pneumonia or pneumonia in immunosuppressed and debilitated patients. This also uh, shares morphologically and structural uh, features with both fungi and protozoan. And this cannot be isolated in culture so that the diagnosis is only based on detecting the troposoids or the cyst using immunofluorescent stain of the bronchoalveolar lavage specimen or with the use of the uh, specific monoclonal antibody attached to an immunofluorescent uh, stain plus also we can do a uh, PCR method, which is the most common, acceptable, and 100% uh, sensitivity and specificity for the diagnosis of pneumocystis. Another picture of methanamine uh, silver strain uh, specimen See the cyst, which is black in, in color, about four to six microns in diameter. 
And the other one is stained with polychrome metanamine blue, uh, which at a lower magnification. Another uh, disease that is uh, an unusual, uh, that cause uh, unusual uh, fungal infection would be the hyalo hypho mycosis. So this is caused by pigmented uh, fungi. Uh, specifically, we have the Fusarium solani culture, which of course uh, produces uh, pink or red pigment on culture. So when we see on culture a pigmented, uh, pigmented filamentous fungus, we think of Fusarium as one of the possible pathogens until we see the lactophenol cotton blue microscopically. This is the appearance of the, the, uh, of the spores of Fusarium. Another one here is uh, an, for another pathogen, which is the Cydosporium uh, apiospermum or pro, uh, Cydosporium proliferans, which also causes uh, invasive uh, fungal infection. Although it is rare, we see once in a while this isolate in the uh, immune compromised patients in the lab. And this is the histopathologic appearance of Cydosporium apiospermum in a heart bulb. Another uh, new soft fungal infection is the one caused by Talaromyces marnefii or Penicillium marnefii before. This is the culture, another pigmented species or another pigmented fungus. So it's a toss between the Fusarium and the uh, Penicillium species, particularly marnefii. Now, this is the only species of a penic under this Penicillium species that is uh, dimorphic because most of the penicillium species are monomorphic so it appears only in a filamentous form so maybe that is uh, that is the reason why it is renamed as talaromyces marnefii not only because it is dimorphic but also because of the dna um, description or morphology of the of the fungus so this is the typical appearance of the lactophenol cotton blue from culture uh, the brush appearance of the uh, of the uh, spores, and this one is at 37 degrees incubation, showing us the uh, organism in yeast form, which has a characteristic binary fission. So another pic other pictures of uh, penicil of Talaromyces marnefii see the characteristic. Uh, uh, shape of the of the uh, of the organism with the single septum at the middle and it is pigmented now these are the papules uh, uh, that are found in the H in hiv patients infected with talaromyces marnefii another fungus that causes uh, unusual fungal infection will be the trichosporonosis or trichosporon asahi. So this is the picture. It can be mistaken for candida uh, or other fungal pathogens. And this, there's no, there's antigenic cross-reaction activity with Cryptococcus neoformans when we do the callus. So when we do cala, when we have a callus positive uh, CSF, we have to be careful also because this uh, cross-reacts with the trichosporon acai or trichosporon species. So this is the culture uh, of the organism. It can be cultured from blood, urine, and other lesions. It characterized as white to cream heaping colonies. And identification is based on the assimil carbohydrate assimilation patterns and also microscopic uh, characteristic uh, of the organism. Plus, uh, this can be seen in cutaneous and uh, samples and blood cultures and also biopsies. Now, Malassezia furfur is usually known to cause skin infection and it is a normal flora of the skin. However, in some patients, it can cause systemic Malassezia infection, especially in neonates or children who are under uh, lipid therapy. Uh, in IV therapy. And as we know, Malassezia 44 is uh, oil or lipid loving organism. That is why in culture, 
we add olive oil on the saborod agar plate before we inoculate the culture plate. So let's go to the modern trend in the idea of invasive uh, fungal infection. We have Dr. Uh, uh, Chua and Dr. Uh, um, the other one, sorry, uh, we, they had described, uh, Jennifer Chua uh, described the different uh, techniques or methods of identifying the fungus in clinical specimens. And we have, just to enumerate, we have the DNA probe assay, serologic testing, Malditoff MS, PCR, and the next generation sequencing. So for the DNA probe assay, it makes use of uh, a specific uh, nucleic acid probe to attach to the fungus pathogen in the specimen, which is attached to an, uh, to an indicator. And with serology, I think this has been discussed already. Uh, Beta-glucan, we have other, uh, we have the galactomannan uh, test. For Malditoff MS, once we culture or isolate the fungal uh, organism, we can perform Malditoff MS for identifying the species, genus and species, in just a matter of 30 seconds. That's how fast it is done. So we can identify and and inform the clinicians of the identity of the organism prior to the do, to doing the sensitivity test using the sensitizer. And for PCR, the although it is not yet available uh, in some laboratories, it is included for yeast pathogens. It is included in the film array panel testing, including the those in the pulmonary uh, panel or pneumonia panel. But for specific uh, identifications in a single uh, platform, it is not yet available. It is usually uh, can be detected, especially the yeast pathogens, in a panel format or platform. And lastly, the next generation sequencing, which is the future of uh, not only in fungal uh, identification or fungal pathogen identification, but almost in all microbiological pathogens determine, uh, detection, which is uh, bacteria, viruses, and even parasites. So in conclusion, we still need culture uh, as the gold standard. We, we still need the uh, morphological identification of the spores of the fungus. However, one, one uh, dilemma here is that most of the fungal fungus uh, or, or fungi that are pathogenic, especially the systemic pathogens, are very slow growers and need to incubate it for at least four weeks. So it, it really delays the management of the patient. So we make use of special stains when we do histopath uh, uh, section with the use of the PAS, the GMS, Music Carmine, Wright's Gems stain, calcol floor stain, which would help us in the identification of the presence of fungal elements. However, we still uh, cannot um, make a commitment of the genus or species of the organism. We can only have the possibility or we can only report the possible pathogen. Now, with the use of uh, immunohistochemical stain with the use of the specific antibody, it would help a lot if we um, use this immunohistochemical stain with a specific monoclonal antibody. Also, with the use of specific genetic probes to detect fungal DNA for the speciation of fungi. And Malditoff MS for the speciation of fungal cultures, which also includes the filamentous forms. And of course, last but not the least, and I have said earlier, the future of infectious of fungal pathogen identification will be the molecular methods like PCR and the next generation sequencing. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Lagamayo. I will now turn over this session to Dr. 
Raquel K. Ikarma for the case presentations. And if you follow the cases with us, you will feel the challenge that the consultants experienced while seeing these patients. Dr. K. Hello, good morning to everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Ikarma, and I will be your moderator for the three interesting and unique cases we will have to present to you the diversity of invasive fungal diseases in the Philippines. In the interest of time, we will be presenting these cases and discussing certain key points during the case presentations. All the questions of the participants will be entertained, time permitting, after all the cases have been presented. Please write your questions in the Q&A portion provided. We are delighted to have with us our reactor for the cases. He is Dr. Ilan S. Schwartz. He is the assistant professor, uh, a consultant in the general and transplant infectious diseases in the University of Alberta Hospital, Alberta Health Services. Uh, we will also be assisted by our two speakers prior, Dr. Um, Jackson D, who will be helping us in our uh, if we have complex um, questions in our radiology portion, and Dr. Lagamayo to interpret our our slides. I'd like to call in uh, Dr. Jed Reyes, who will be presenting our first case. Dr. Ra, may I uh, call in first Dr. Sibel Abad okay. instead of Dr. Jed Reyes? Okay, so we'll call in first uh, Dr. Sibel Abad to present our first case. Good morning, everyone. Let me just share my slides. I'll be presenting the first case. We have a 28-year-old female with history of recently diagnosed AML who was admitted for fever. This is how she looks like when she comes in. Her history of present illness starts about a month prior to admission when she underwent induction chemotherapy with doxorubicin and cytarabine for AML and had an uncomplicated stay at the outside hospital. She was not discharged on any anti-infectives. About four days prior to admission, she was again admitted in a local hospital in Cavite, which is a province in the Philippines of her blood transfusion she just stayed a day, but was uh, developed fever thereafter, which persisted, prompting consult at our institution at the UPPGH. On the day of her admission, she had an ANC of 1,400, and she was started empirically on piperacillin tazobactam, followed by meropenem with lysis of fever. Cultures were negative at this time. She then had a complicated hospital course, and she stayed for a month. And around a month into her admission, she was given her second cycle of chemotherapy with low dose cetarabine for six days, which she tolerated well. She was also given fluconazole and levofloxacin while she was neutropenic. Her lowest ANC or her nadir was zero. About two weeks later or 15 days later, she develops facial edema, but no pain, fever, and erythema. She denied any pain and tenderness on the site as well. At this time, her CBC shows pancytopenia with an ANC of zero. She was then started empirically on meropenem and vancomycin. Unfortunately, there was rapid progression of edema with necrosis of the nose, and I'll show you a photo to follow about three days later. This was now associated with facial pain and nasal fullness. Her CBC shows some recovery of her ANC to 450, which remains cytopenic. She was then started on empiric antifungal therapy with amphotericin B and a CT of the sinuses and CT of the chest was done. So I'll show you her photo here. So she does have blackening or necrosis around the nasal area. And she has some facial edema, as you can see over here, especially around the periorbital area. And I think I would like to call on Dr. D just to highlight a few comments on the CT of the sinuses shown here. Okay, uh, I hope that you can hear me. Okay, uh, I'm being shown here two images, actual images of the paranasal sinuses, 
one in the soft tissue window, which is on your left hand side, and the other on the uh, the bone window on your right hand side. So basically, what you could see uh, on these two images are the presence of opacities within both maxillary sinuses. Uh, the right being in, uh, affected more than the left side. Uh, the oh. one on the right maxillary sinus shows a little bit of heter heterogeneity as compared to the left side. And what is most striking here, although I'm not presented with a coronal image, is the erosion of the uh, medial walls of both paranasal sinuses with the encroachment of the opacities within both nasal cavities here. So I don't know if I'll be able to use my annotation. So I don't know if you would be able to see my arrows. So this would be the area of uh, erosion of the medial walls of both paranasal sinuses. So this tells us basically that we have uh, something aggressive affecting the paranasal sinuses in both sides. Um, I'd just like to ask, uh, Jackson, um, yes. can you identify the etiology of the organism causing um, the infection with just radiologic just images? Radiologic. It's going to be very difficult, as what I mentioned in my previous lecture, that uh, there is some overlap between uh, fungal infection and uh, bacterial infection. And also with some, uh, amongst the fungal among infection the itself, there's also itself some, some, some overlapping. Uh, the way it looks here, it doesn't look like it's malignant, uh, but it's more of uh, related to an infectious process. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. D. Here is another cut uh, over here. Uh, are there any other comments for this one? So for these two images that's being presented, uh, what we could basically see would be the involvement of the uh, bilateral ethmoid sinuses, but not as bad as, as what we saw earlier with uh, how the right maxillary sinuses were in, uh, or the bilateral maxillary sinuses were involved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Ma'am, should we proceed? Yes, yes, uh, let's proceed. So uh, this next slide will show you some cuts of the lung and I think I can take, uh, take this one. Uh, so you have a pulmonary nodule over here uh, and here's the lung window, which shows uh, quite a significant size of a pulmonary nodule. About nine days later, she undergoes debridement, sinusotomy, maxillary antrostomy, very complicated procedure with removal of deceased tissue of the hard palate. And this is kind of what it looks like. So basically they remove uh, the entirety of her uh, nasal cavity and her nose. So now we have some microscopic findings uh, taken from the debridement, the extensive debridement. I would like to call on um, Dr. Lagdemaya to comment on these microscopic findings. Yes, uh, I can see here hyphal elements. If I can, it's not magnified, uh, which is uh, showing spores or sporangium and some uh, yeah, filamentous. It is, non, it is sinusitic, meaning there are no septum or septa, and it is high line, which is clear. So it could belong to the uh, group of pycomyces. It could be uh, mucor, or it could be more of mucor species, because mucor and rhizopus species are similar looking except for that rhizopus species has rhizoids in it at the end. But this one, I can hardly see any rhizoids. So uh, it's a little bit small. So anyway, it could be, yeah, it could be from the um, my, uh, pycomyces uh, group. So it could be a mucor species. This one is, this one is uh, another picture. Is this the direct, another picture from the same? Uh, is this from culture? This one this, on the right? This is still um, from microscopy. Direct, this is direct, direct microscopy, microscopy, this one. Correct. I felt. 
This one is from culture the, uh, on the left. I'm sure this is from because usually if it is a direct smear from a tissue, we usually see only high fall elements. So this must be coming from a culture already. And this is the lactophenol cotton blue smear, which shows the spherules, uh, the sporangium, sorry, the sporangium and the uh, stalk or the hyphae. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Lagamaya. And I will show you the plate, which is uh, here. Uh, any comments on this one? So this one is uh, cottony, white cottony. Uh, I don't know if it is rapid grower, but usually the mucor species and the rhizopus species are, are rapid growers. And they look similar. It is cottony on, on, on SDA. So I wonder how many days uh, it took this organism to grow on this plate. We need, in, in identifying the fungus, we need to know whether it is a slow grower or a fast grower. A fast grower is some, uh, it's the, those that grow within seven days, within five to seven days. But after seven days, we consider it as a slow grower. So mucor and rhizopus species are rapid growers. Thank you so much for bringing up those very important points. So a uh, member of Phacomyces, uh, aseptate on microscopy and this one uh, powdery and it did grow rapidly within five to seven days. Uh, so going back to our patient, so she was then treated with amphotericin B for a total of 40 days and had no fungal growth on repeat tissue culture, but she did have a very complicated hospital course because of a surgical site infection. And she actually decided to be discharged against medical advice but as of this November, she is alive and well. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this case. I'll bring it back now to uh, Dr. Ikarma. Yeah, so um, we have a lot of um, what we call learning, points in, this learning case. points in this case. And I'd like to call in Dr. Schwartz to comment on a few questions. First, um, the patient was given prophylactic antibiotic. Um, and it, she was only given Can you comment on okay. prophylactic antifungal drugs in patients undergoing chemotherapy for different types of leukemia, like acute leukemias, ALL or AML, and the chronic leukemias like CML and CLL? Do we need them and is there evidence for their use? So, uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, the organizers for having me. This has been a fantastic uh, meeting so far. So, thank you very much. It's really a privilege. Um, so, we have very good data for, um, for prophylactic um, anti-mold um, therapy in AML. Uh, there was a, a randomized controlled trial published uh, by Cornelli in 2006 or 2007. Uh, using posiconazole in uh, induction for the first 30 days in AML. And uh, it, was, it was published alongside another uh, RCT looking at uh, posiconazole suppression or uh, prophylaxis in graft-versus-host disease. And those are two of the, the highest risk um, situations, but particularly AML. Um, with that said, not every center does, uh, does this. I know... Um, uh, Dr. Manette has uh, told me that posiconazole is not available in the Philippines, uh, so there's a uh, little option for that. Now, in that trial, posiconazole was compared to fluconazole, and so we know clearly posiconazole, which is an anti um, antifungal, is better than fluconazole, which is not an anti mold, it's an anti yeast. It has very limited uh, activities against any molds. And so clearly, um, Clearly, uh, posiconazole is better. However, uh, it has not, to my knowledge, been compared head-to-head -head with voriconazole, which is the more pertinent question for your setting, um, or even itraconazole, uh, which, which is available. Um, you know, in, in those circumstances, um, there would be a number of infections, uh, of aspergillus infections that would be pre prevented. Perhaps some other infections like fusarium, 
but this case would not have been uh, um, avoided. So uh, the mucoreles are not uh, affected by either voriconazole or itraconazole. So unfortunately, um, this case was probably unavoid unavoidable in the absence of um, having having other agents on the market in the Philippines. I think there's less data for the other forms of uh, of uh, cancer induction. So CML you mentioned and, and CLL. Uh, generally, the induction is less aggressive, and so uh, the the risk of uh, prolonged neutropenia is lower, and so uh, the, the 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 benefits of uh, of prophylaxis are are lower in those uh, settings. I'd also like to ask. Do you think that um, giving of posaconazole could have prevented the occurrence of sinonasal mucormycosis in our patient? Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm not sure. So a lot of uh, places, the protocol is uh, for the first 30 days of induction. And uh, if I caught it correctly, this was actually the second cycle of induction. Yes. Um, that, that this patient was infected. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I, I think I think it definitely could have. It's hard to know when the patient became infected. Was this something that they acquired while they were in the hospital, or was it something they brought in with them? Uh, maybe their uh, sinuses were colonized at the time of admission, and then. Uh, but we know that uh, that uh, the mucoreles are, um, you know, they're they're. Um, in the air all the time. And, and so if you do sampling uh, studies in hospitals, particularly if there's construction going on, then you will find it. Uh, but there was also a study uh, recently at uh, transplant centers across the United States that found mucoreles on linen uh, at the majority of, of transplant centers. So, so really we should assume that people are being exposed to it all the time. So, I, so sorry, the bottom line is I think I think the post console would have uh, prevented this infection, but can't know for sure. Okay. So um, how long do we treat these patients along with surgical de debridement? And what agents can uh, do we usually give? And um, do you believe in um, combining antifungal drugs, especially for very hard to treat infect um, fungal infections? So, um, so the, the, the main component of therapy here is aggressive debridement. And clearly she had very aggressive debridement. You could see the, the tissue that was remaining was, you know, was healthy, it was red. Um, and so, uh, so, so this is you know, the, the most important thing. On the other hand, the patient still had these pulmonary lesions which had not been resected and this, that part was left out of the story. And so uh, she is still, uh, in quite a bit of trouble, you know, even uh, even beyond the, the surgical uh, intervention. So clearly needs treatment. We don't have a lot of great data for how long to treat with um, amphotericin B deoxycholate. Typically, the the current um, European Confederation of Medical Mycology ECMM guidelines are for uh, liposomal amphotericin B. Uh, and then followed eventually by step down to either posiconazole or isaviconazole. And uh, the duration would be for many months, um, depending on how comfortable you are with the uh, immune reconstitution and with the uh, margins of resection. 40 days of amphotericin B, to be honest, I would have felt very uncomfortable um, with, with her leaving uh, at, at that stage. I'm really, really happy to hear that she's doing well. Uh, the other question was about combination chemotherapy, uh, um, antifungal therapy, and so uh, this is a controversial area because it's a data-free zone. Uh, we don't have data to suggest it works, but this is such a highly morbid disease that there's little downside uh, beyond the cost implications of adding uh, an echinocandin. Um, and if, if you have it, uh, a, a mold-active azole. I think would be very reasonable. At the same time, uh, this isn't recommended in the current iteration of the, the ECMM uh, guidelines, which were just released last year. 
My last question is, um, I'm sure the patient uh, might not have gone into remission. Can we clear the patient for further chemotherapy after these kinds of infections? So um, it's, I mean, it's going to be a difficult assessment, but at the end of the day, you might not have a choice. Um, I would probably feel more comfortable uh, for this patient to be on amphotericin B while undergoing induction um, would, would probably be the, the safest thing. Um, but I, I don't think that um, uh, further chemotherapy can be, can be withhold uh, given the, the effects on ultimate survival for her. So I would treat through it with an antifungal. Okay. Um, do you have any last messages or a summary for the patient for this case? Although later I'll ask you to give your um, learning points for all the cases. Um, no, I mean, this is obviously a devastating case. And, um, you know, the moment that there's mention of, you know, facial pain and swelling, it just in a neutropenic patient makes makes me so nervous. Um, and I think, I think everyone else feels the same as well. So, um, you know, my, my only uh, comment is that maybe nine days from diagnosis until uh, surgical debridement seems like, like maybe that could have been a bit shorter, but I don't want to be too critical of, uh, of the surgeons because obviously there's lots of, uh, lots of moving parts and lots of issues I've played, but for sure, you know, the most important thing is aggressive surgical debridement. That's noted. Okay, now we'll, we'll, we will go to our second case and it, um, it's a little more um, complicated than this. And we'd like to call in Dr. Jed Reyes to present the case. Hello, good morning. So I'll be presenting the second case for this symposium. Okay, so, so we have JH, a 41-year-old female, known case of chronic kidney disease secondary to chronic glomerulonephritis for 10 years, who underwent allogeneic kidney transplant last 2016. She was completely asymptomatic and was non-dialysis requiring until three months prior to admission, patient had increasing levels of creatinine on follow-up with her private physician. Kidney biopsy was done which showed uh, acute T-cell mediated rejection. She was advised to undergo met pulse metal prednisolone pulse therapy and anti-thymus globulin administration for the acute rejection. After administration of these immunosuppressants, she was noted to have um, decreasing WBC counts. However, uh, patient claims to be completely asymptomatic. No additional medications were added on top of her maintenance medications. But due to the persistence and worsening pancytopenia, she was advised to work up for the pancytopenia. So here is her past medical history. Noted that uh, after 2016, after her kidney transplant, uh, she was lost to follow up. Her maintenance medications since 2016 include tacrolimus, mycophenolate mofetil, prednisone, valcanzyclovir, and prophylactic doses of trimethylprim sulfometoxazole. Her social and environmental history are both unremarkable. His pertinent physical examination findings are shown in bold figures, consistent of one taking steroids and uh, consistent with oral candidiasis or oral thrush. So the admitting impression during that time was a drug-induced pancytopenia, and the primary drug implicated is anti-thymocyte globulin. Cannot totally, cannot totally rule out the concomitant effects of her other maintenance medication, which could suppress the bone marrow, including valgancyclovir and mycophenolate mofetil. So during the course of during the first day of admission, patient has asymptomatic and has no focus of fever, but with an admitting ANC of zero and thrombocytopenia with anemia. GCSF was started, and all maintenance medications were discontinued were continued except for mycophenolate mofetil. Noted, there is still elevated creatinine despite the previous immunosuppression. On the fourth hospital day, still with an ANC of zero, patient uh, had, her, had her first episode of fever.
still without any accompanying symptoms. Physical examination was generally unremarkable and unchanged since admission. Febrile neutropenia was considered and ID service was called. Uh, blood and urine CS were requested and patient was started on piperacillin tazobactam and fluconazole was started for the oral candidiasis. On the eighth hospital day, patient developed non-productive cough, throat itchiness, and acute onset of right leg pain and swelling. Patient denied dyspnea, hemoptysis, and shortness of breath. On physical examination, patient can tolerate room air, but has resting tachycardia. Noted a unilateral right leg edema with diffuse typical eruption. The impression during that time was acute deep vein thrombosis of the right leg, which was uh, easily documented with a venous duplex scan, revealing acute to subacute deep vein thrombosis with total occlusion of the right distal external iliac and common femoral vein. IVC filter was inserted the next day since anticoagulants cannot be started due to the thrombocytopenia as seen here. Also noted, ANC despite GCSF is zero. On the 12th hospital day, patient had worsening cough and now complained of um, there were no complaints of dyspnea, hemoptysis, and, and exertional dyspnea, but there was now re recurrence of fever and now had adventitious breath sounds. The impression during that time was hospital acquired pneumonia, so piperacillin tazobactam was stepped up to meropenem. Blood and urine CS uh, did not show any growth during this time. So here's the chest x ray done during admission. In the interest of time, I'm going to. Um, interpret this. So this the day of the first day of admission, the chest x-ray was officially read out as having clear lung fields. However, on the 12th hospital day, there was note of incident um, findings of suprahilar and perihilar infiltrates. On the 13th hospital day, the decision to fully withdraw immunosuppressants was made and patient underwent hemodialysis. Still, ANC revealed zero and as well as anemia and thrombocytopenia. 17th hospital day, patient had worsening cough and now was auto requiring at two liters per minute. Levofloxacin was added to meropenem for additional pseudomonal coverage, despite the sputum CS coming out as a drug sensitive acinetobacter baumani. The regimen was not de escalated during this time because of the worsening clinical parameters. So, again, here's the chest x ray done in the 12th hospital day. On the 17th hospital day, there was um, quite regression of the infiltrates on the right side. This was officially read as tricky opacities cannot totally rule out atelectasis. And as you can see here, is there is the right-sided internal jugular vein catheter properly in place. On the 20th hospital day, patients still had low-grade fever, the same degree of coughing, and was now noted to have black stares for a few minutes but patient denies any new symptoms and patient claims that she was completely aware of her, of the events. Antibiotics were shifted to cefepine and tigacycline to avoid lowering the threshold of the so-called seizure with the use of fluoroquinolones and carbapenems. So during the 21st hospital day, here's the chest x-ray from the completely uh, relatively benign looking 17th hospital day chest x-ray there is no noted progression of the para, right, right perihilar and suprahilar opacities with interval appearance of left perihilar and retrocardiac opacities. So one week of immunosuppressants on the 22nd hospital day, there is no improving WBC count, platelet count, but there was still anemia. This is in the context that the patient is uh, clinically uh, deteriorating with regards of her cough and her uh, hypoxemia. On the 26th hospital day, the sputum culture that we requested uh, after six days of incubation was officially released to have few growth of filamentous organisms. So here is the plate. May I request Dr. Lagamayo to please uh, comment on this plate, the image? So, yeah, this is a rapid grower. Rapid grower. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It, um, it, it is... Uh, like velvety, yeah. It could be, well, it's a choice between aspergillus species unless I, I, I cannot I, commit I, at this point without looking at the microscopic uh, features. 
as long as uh, in the identification of fungi, uh, we have to look at the spores under the microscope. So at this point, this is a filamentous fungus, a rapid grower, which might be a choice of Aspergillus species or other uh, uh, similar group of uh, filamentous pathogen that are rapid growers. But the most common is Aspergillus species. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, during that time, also when I asked the medical technologist re regarding the possible isolates, uh, they can also commit to the yes. to the speciation during and that time. We have time. to that's look why... at it under the microscope. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your inputs. So that's why during the, the time that the result came out, further microbiologic workup were requested. Um, and during this time, there was non-resolution of symptoms despite the broad spectrum antibiotics. So the ID service impression during that time was pulmonary nocardiosis versus aspergillosis, and the following workups were requested. So upon fungal CS, may I call on again Dr. Lagamaya to please comment on this. Uh, when we subcultured the isolate from the chocolate agar plate to the subroots dextrose agar. Now we can clearly see this one, the, the green color, the one that I have shown you earlier in my lecture. It looks like more of Aspergillus species at this time with this subculture. So, okay. but still, we need the microscopic. Uh, uh, examination to confirm our identification. So luckily, the medical technologist um, agreed to have the smear done yeah. using lactophenol cotton. Yes. So may I call, may I comment on this slide again, ma'am? Okay, so it looks like Aspergillus. Yeah, that is Aspergillus species. And if we want to speciate it further, we can do the Malditoff to speciate uh, the organism. So it could be Aspergillus fumigatus or other species of Aspergillus that is commonly seen in the environment. Okay, thank you. The medical technologist was not, um, cannot really also commit on the, the speciation of the Aspergillus during this time because the colonies were relatively young at this time, yes. during the 48 um, hour of incubation. So they, what they did Probably what they should do is to do micro micro mic, uh, microculture because it would give a beautiful relationship of the spores with the hyphae. Because if we do a lactophenol cotton blue smear directly from the culture plate, we do the teasing method and it will destroy the, the appearance of the spores and the hyphal elements. So that is one way of... Uh, identifying them after growing the organism we do the microculture method and we, the one that we use with the cover slip and we after since this is a rapid grower in a few days time we can harvest this uh, microculture uh, plate and get the cover slip and mount it in another lactophenol cotton blue slide and then we can clearly see, appreciate the uh, spores of this uh, fungus Thank you, ma'am. So aside from the fungal culture of the sputum, we requested for a CT scan with IV contrast. So uh, I'll, be uh, I'll be showing the representative slides of the chest CT scan with IV contrast. May I request Dr. D to please comment on this representative slide? Okay. Uh, I'm shown here an axial image of the upper thoracic region. I'm seeing at least two nodular lesions uh within close to the uh right uh, mediastinal area and one in the uh uh posterior segment of the right upper lobe uh other than that i'm not seeing anything else so the findings are still very non-specific yeah yes sir. i'm not shown here i wasn't able to take a photo of the other um uh images but um the official reading here was there were scattered peripheral wedge-like and linear uh, densities, which could be atelectasis or pulmonary infarcts. There were mass-like consolidation with speculated borders and perilational ground glass opacities. I and think the peri were, sorry, but the perilational ground glass opacities could have been seen better with the long window, and yes, that sir. would point out more to an infection rather than uh, a neoplastic process in this case. And again, for, for uh, 
nodular lesions, it's really quite uncommon to see big lesions like this one for tuberculosis or other bacterial infections. So that would, you know, uh, point you more to a uh, fungal infection already. And if you will review the slides here, uh, there were very sized non-calcified nodules scattered in both lungs. So the consideration during that time, uh, not knowing that the patient is immunocompromised, was sep perceptic emboli or metastatic process. So another CT scan image is right here, sir. Right here, sir. Okay, this is a slice this is a lower slide. than the uh, first slide, and it is in the level of the pulmonary artery. Uh, what we could see here is a straddling uh, filling defect within the uh, main pulmonary artery extending to both right and left pulmonary arteries, uh, representing and uh, signifying the presence of thrombus formation or pulmonary embolism. Yes, sir. So this was officially uh, read, uh, read out as the saddle embolus, um, occluding both pulmonary arteries. Thank you, sir, for your inputs. So during the 28th hospital day, the final sputum culture uh, revealed aspergillus flavus, which was uh, voriconazole and echinocandin sensitive, but amphotericin B resistant. Fluconazole was readily shifted to voriconazole, and that's the time that's the only time serum galactomannan was requested. As you can see here, despite um, withdrawal of the immunosuppressants and antibiotic uh, broad spectrum antibiotic administration, there was already improvement in the WBC count and platelet count A and C, but there was still anemia. On the 33rd hospital day, due to persistent anemia, patient had was scheduled for colonoscopy for further workup, but was immediately deferred due to a recurrence of the seizure preceded by blank stares during her hemodialysis. This was characterized as stiffening of extremities and extension of both legs, now with retrograde amnesia, and this was worse and longer than the first episode. So this is our, her serial CBC during that time. And during the second episode, neurology service was called and a cranial MRI was requested. So lastly, Dr. J Dr. D, may you please um, have your comments on the cranial MRI with IV contrast? So I'm, okay, for this one, I'm presented with two axial images, one taken in the flare sequence and the other one in the T2-weighted sequence. Uh, both shows a cortical-subcortical uh, mass-like lesion with uh, mild perilesional edema. Uh, if we're going to look very closely within the T2-weighted image along the periphery of the said mass, would be areas of uh, what appears to be cystic-looking uh, lesions. Now, if we have the contrast study, then it could have provided additional image, uh, additional information. But again, it's going to be difficult to differentiate between a uh, low to moderate grade malignant lesion as against to an infectious process also. Okay. Uh, sad, sadly, we were not clear. Uh, the patient was not cleared for gadolinium administration due to her renal insufficiency. So we are only cleared for a plain MRI. So this was actually uh, read out as having a right frontal lobe mass uh, with vasogenic edema. They cannot totally rule out uh, in, their, in, the, in the result a, what they call this, um, isolated sinus venous thrombosis. They, they, thus, they are requesting for a angiogram, M MRI or MRA. So MRI results were noted. So neurosurgery evaluation was requested immediately. Serum galactomannan that was previously requested turned out to be positive with an elevated index of 3.21. So immediately after, one day after the referral to neurosurgery, a frontal craniotomy, right, with excision biopsy of right frontal, frontal mass was, with frozen section was done. Intraoperative finding, as you can see here with the photo, is a yellowish necrotic mass visualized over the right, right uh, visualized over the brain parenchyma. Frozen section diagnosis was not contribute, cannot contribute, so it was only gliotic cerebral tissues. So Dr. Lagamayo, here is the specimen, that, the brain tissue specimen that was, uh, that was submitted to the histopathology. Can I hear your comments, Bo? Very small. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, It's hard to see. <laughs> I cannot um, uh, magnify it uh, with this, but... Uh, Looks like there are some yeasts. Uh, it, I will 
Yeah, looks like there are some yes here. But we still need to, I need a bigger view or a higher magnification or probably a special stain for this uh, sample. Uh, yes. It could be PAS or GMS. This is an HNE &E stain, right? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah, so very difficult to to ha to, to have a clue uh, with a simple uh, right uh, simple H uh, &E stain. We need the at least the PAS or the GMS stain or the Music Carmine stain in order to view the the uh, fungal parts or fungal elements here. So I would um, suggest for this slide, we have to do additional staining uh, technique or method. Okay, so it's hard to say that. Maybe it's just the quality of the <laughs> image as shown Yes, here. but it's very small. I cannot uh, appreciate the... So this one, this is the, this the LPO. Yeah, low power, yes, this is the high yes, power. Yes, ma'am. So it looks like there are some yeast. Is it capsulated or? No, These are high fat elements, man. This was uh, okay, shown okay. by uh, the... the. This one, yeah, I can see the. Uh, it is dichotomous. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, dichotomous branching. Yeah. So this could be a filamentous uh, fungus, uh, very typical of well aspergillus. However, there are other filamentous fungi that could assume the same uh, branching and uh, could be mistaken. So still we need the culture at this point with a fresh yes, specimen, not a formalized uh, of, uh, specimen. We need a fresh culture here. So, as, as discussed earlier, these are high fat elements with, I think there's mononuclear cell infiltration here. Yes, mononuclear. Um, yes, yeah, and this one's... I think uh, when I talk with the pathologist, during that time, uh, they're saying that there are acute angulation of the hyphal elements here. Acute angle. So for us, that is aspergillus. When you have the right angle, it could be mucor or the pycom yes, pycomyces uh, group. But if it is a dichotomous branching or acute angle, which is 45 degrees, it could be aspergillus species. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Poppy. Yeah. So here's another photo. I think this could be a better, a bigger. Uh, bigger photo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These are the high fault elements arranged in like fence like appearance. Yeah, a cross section actually. Yes, because when you cut you you cut the high fault elements. And so they are they are in bundles. Imagine a bundle of uh, high fault elements and cut into slice. And so you see the central uh, part of the hyphae. Yeah. And in your right. Uh, the red arrow is pointed actually to a multinucleated cell. We yeah. still with interspersed high fat elements. And I think if without the high fat elements and you're going to just look at the multinucleated cell, you would mistake this as tuberculosis in my right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the final result is a necrotizing granuloma with vasoinvasive high fat elements, morphologically consistent with aspergillus. Species. Yes, species, yes. So the brain tissue, however, did not grow anything on fungal culture. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> I don't know if there is a they should effect submit, of fluoroconazole. Uh, yeah, they should submit immediately the, I mean, if they are planning to do, to request for a culture, it should be together with the histopath and do not immerse in formalin. It should be in a sterile saline, sterile water, saline only. water only. Okay. So the working impression during that time post-op was already disseminate astrogelosis. Uh, histopathologic evidence with the CNS and sputum result of aspergillus from the pulmonary. So that is my slide. That's, that is my last slide. Thank you. Jed, did the did the patient survive? Um, no, ma'am. The patient died after a few weeks, two weeks after the operation. Discussed with the uh, the team that handled her. I think she died of massive hemoptysis. Okay. So um, first, we ha we had we had already two interesting cases. The first was sinonasal mucormycosis, and this one we have disseminated aspergillosis, lungs and um, um, cranial. Um, and I will just summarize the case. And later we will have um, a little bit of question and answer based on our learning points. So. 
this patient is already immunosuppressed because he had kidney transplant. They usually have three immunosuppressive agents. And he was further immunosuppressed due to acute rejection. So he was given ATG, and usually they increase the dose of the steroids. After which he had another bout of uh, immunosuppressive condition and it's called febrile neutropenia. And as you would see in the course, he was probably neutropenic. We're not sure if it was drug induced for about uh, two weeks to three weeks into the course. He was treated with broad spectrum antibiotics named um, a lot because the initial x-ray showed consolidation, not really typical of a fungal infection. Um, and later, when you had seizures, this was attributed also to electrolyte abnormalities, spe specifically uremia. So there was actually a delay in doing CT scans, CT scan of both the chest and the brain, and probably of further working up for a febrile neutropenia in terms of fungal etiology when the, when the fever was not improving with antibiotics. So I'd like to ask Dr. Schwartz, um, because of the nonspecific infiltrates in the x-ray, along with a prolonged neutropenia and fever, could those infiltrates have been aspergillus early on? When would you have requested for a CT scan of the chest and the brain and um, biomarkers like beta D glucan or galactomannan for this patient? Yeah, so um, a, another very interesting case. Um, so, th so these these questions are difficult to answer because it is it's very much setting specific. So, in my setting with an immune compromised patient who's not uh, clinically improving, not progressing on broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, we would do a, a CT scan of the chest very early, and then when he started to have these blank stares, probably would have done. Usually, we start with a CT head and then we do an MRI head if necessary. Um, but I, you know, I, I also am cognizant of, uh, resource limitations that, you know, you can't do a CT scan on every man right away. Um, and particularly if it's a, a, a public or a government hospital that, that might not be feasible. Uh, but certainly those, uh, pulmonary lesions initially very, very much could have been, um, all due to the aspergillosis. The other, the other um, possibility is we saw that there's quite a large infarction there. So, uh, you know, could that have represented some infarcted lung? Didn't have a, a classic low bar or segmental distribution, but uh, that would be a possibility as well. Okay. With regards to the, uh, the other question about uh, biomarkers, so this is also uh, very much center specific. So we don't have access to beta d glucan. Um, there are other centers in Canada that do, um, and certainly most of my colleagues in the States do have access to it, but I think Dr. Chua outlined a lot of the, uh, the, the issues with uh, pretest probability and, um, you know, difficulty in interpreting the, the results. Uh, but, it, you know, my, my perspective is that it's a data point, and so you can you know, add it to other data points to be able to formulate uh, a picture. And so um, it, it would be helpful, but unfortunately we don't have that. The galactomannan for sure, um, we do have uh, more ready access. We do it in-house twice a week, uh, Tuesday, Thursdays, uh, which does mean that, you know, it could be quite a, a, a wait of four days or so before we get those results back, depending on, on, uh, on when it's collected. Um, the serum galactomannan, is, uh, as Dr. Chua said, um, you know, the sensitivity is not uh, perfect, particularly in a patient that is not a, uh, uh, does not have a hematologic malignancy, did have uh, neutropenia, but um, the, the sensitivity is lower outside of uh, hematologic, oncologic patients. Um, the, 
uh, a bronchoscopy would have um, would have helped to secure the diagnosis um, at an earlier point if uh, if it was available. And so, typically, um, the uh, a galactamin from a, a BAL in addition to uh, fungal culture would have been helpful. The the uh, growth of um, Aspergillus itself in sputum is very nonspecific, um, but Again, it's at one data point and within the constellation of these other um, uh, features and the, the, of the history and the clinical findings uh, does push you towards the diagnosis of, um, of uh, aspergillosis. Yeah, so um, in itself, the sputum, um, as, uh, the growth of aspergillosis, aspergillosis sputum does not tell us anything. In the constellation of aspergillosis, uh, presentation, this is already a clue for us that uh, we might be dealing with disseminated aspergillosis. So um, na, uh, I don't think I have any more questions unless you have anything to add for our case, Dr. Schwartz. Um, so uh, would you... I suppose it's a bit of management and the patient survived. Um, we didn't we didn't hear the details of the of um of the resected but presumably as massive and prison resected so that would be certainly helpful in in being able to the treat his patient. And as I mentioned before, the two most active my knowledge are available in the on the console and on the use to use or choose one of those. The polyclonal is, is probably a little bit better for uh, most um, kind of invasive uh, aspergillosis. We tend, we tend to use interconsal more for chronic pulmonary aspergillosis. Um, um, and and uh, probably we treat for uh, somewhere around nine months a year. And that's the same at that point. Okay. okay, thank you very much. And now we'll call in Dr. Zabat for our third case. Thank you, Dr. Ikarma. Uh, I will just share my screen. So this is a third case for today. This is a case of a 39-year-old male diabetic, insulin-requiring, non-PLHIV smoker who worked in a tobacco factory for 20 years. He has only had one heterosexual partner. He owns lovebirds. He presents with a two to three month history of intermittent fever, usually in the early afternoon and evening with chills. He was then admitted in another hospital and received levofloxacin for pneumonia. He developed also pallor during his stay, but was eventually discharged, improved. This is a chest x-ray done preoperatively. His chest x-ray showed a right peric, it was read with having a right pericardiac pneumonia. His CBC showed a hemoglobin of 13.1 with 40% hematocrit, WBC count of 7,300 with 86% of neutrophils and 159,000 platelet count. A peripheral blood smear was done, which showed normochromic erythrocytes and an isocytosis with fever monocyte. One month prior to admission, there was recurrence of intermittent fever. This was, however, associated already with dysphagia to solids and liquids. There was pain on upper gingiva, minimal gum bleeding, tough anorexia, and weight loss. He also noted enlarging neck masses on the right posterior and bilateral anterior neck. Unfortunately, we don't have a CT scan of the of the neck uh, uh, image, but it was read as having an enlarged palatine tonsils with areas of necrosis. The impression was necrotizing tonsillitis or tonsil pharyngitis with, with bilateral lymphadenopathy and mid leftward nasal septal deviation. So the patient underwent flexible nasopharyngoscopy, tonsillectomy, and fine needle aspiration by the cervical lymph nodes. 
So these are the pictures of the flexible nasal pharyngolaryngoscopy, which showed a nodular fleshy mass on the right, nasopharyngeal area. I'm sorry. So, and the uh, thickened nodular nasopharyngeal mucosa on the right, uh, on the right side. There was also a grade three to four left tonsillar hypertrophy and a grade two right tonsillar hypertrophy. So for the clinical course of the page, they did the biopsy of the left cervical lymph node, which showed this. And may I ask Mayo, if you uh, can see the histopathology? This is uh, the left cer cervical lymph node fine needle aspiration biopsy with PAS staining. Looks like uh, yeast cells to me. Uh, with uh, are these daughter cells around it? Some. Yeah, yeah. are they? Uh, I th they were read as, as spores, parent spores, yeah. no? Yeah. yeah, with yes. multiple. The, the, the history is there a history of travel of the patient of the in, other in other countries? History of travel, Doctor. Huh? No history of travel. No history of travel. So, at uh, this, this is a budding yeast. Uh, uh, this is a yeast uh, organism that is found in, in this lymph node. Uh, I'm just looking around. Uh, it looks like there are some daughter cells around it. Okay. Thank you, Doctora. Yeah. So, this was read as mycotic lymph adenitis. Okay. It says with yeah, fungal elements and spores. Mm -hmm. That was the official reading. Now to summarize the the cultures uh, that were released, so from the uh, intraop specimen, the left tonsils and the left cervical node were both negative for AFB smear, but the left tonsil was positive for MTB PCR DNA. The left cervical node is negative. Both were, however, negative for the MTB culture. The left tonsil, however, grew candida albicans, and the left cervical node did not grow anything. So the patient was then discharged stable on fluconazole. He then followed up and was started on anti-TB regimen for extrapulmonary tuberculosis. The final histopathologic report showed chronic granulomatous inflammation with necrosis with intracytoplasmic microorganisms present consistent with histoplasmosis, even with the culture result, and was positive for a silver methanamine stain. So they again did the tissue stains for AFD, PAS, and GEMSA negative. So then because of that histo, uh, histopathologic report, luconazole was then shifted to itraconazole at 200 milligrams, three times a day for three days as loading dose, then twice daily for one and a half months, which the patient took regularly. However, the patient discontinued the medications on his own due to financial constraints. He just took fluconazole once daily instead. The patient claims to have improvement of symptoms with decrease in size, size of the cervical lymph adenopathy. Until seven months post the first biopsy, they noted the appearance of several nodules. First, there was a non-tender, well-circumscribed nodule on the submandibular area. Then a 1.5 by 1 cm nodule on the right side of the penile shaft and a 1 by 1 cm nodule on the left side of the penile shaft. The patient then underwent excision biopsy of the subbanimbular and penile shaft nodules and these turned out to be TB PCR negative. So the fungal cultures were plated on SDA plates of, uh, and, then, uh, and fungal cultures were done of the intraoperative specimen and incubated. And may I ask again, Dr. Lagamayo, if you can shed some light 
on both these specimens from the submandibular and the penile shaft specimens. I just want to know if the this is a slow grower fungus. Uh, slow grower. Yeah. So this is a difficult case difficult actually. Case. <laughs> so with slow grower uh, growing fung fungi in an immunocompromised patient, well, anything goes. Uh, but still, uh, the history of the patient is very important. Exposure to endemic areas is also very important. As of this moment, uh, this looks like a... Uh, 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 it is gray and slow growing. So I still need to look at the microscopic uh, exam of this uh, colonies. Uh, I will still go for the, mm -hmm. if there is the available uh, lactophenol cotton blue for uh, this growth. What was done, Tara, is a gram stain in AFB smear aside from the histopath. So this is the gram stain an AFB smear of the of the mold face of the organism. This one, the yes. arrow. This is the gram. The AFB smear. The gram stain. This is the gram stain. The one on the left, the one that I'm pointing at, and this one is the very this here. Yeah, I could not. Uh, Still, I could not still commit, but I'm sure there is a presence of fungus, fungal element in this slide. Fungal element in this slide. But I still cannot commit what organ, what fungus is uh, causing this infection. I need to see the microscopic uh, examination of the colonies. This was read, this as, was a, read as, a, as a thick walled spherical microconidia with spike like projections of tuberculosis. <coughs> Conidia arising from short conidiophores. So that this is from the mold, the mold face that is from culture already. Yes, because we cannot see uh, the tuberculate or uh, micro uh, the macroconidia in the uh, in this in this tissue. So this is typical of uh, histoplasma, right? The tuberculate macroconidia. Yes, Dr. Ra. Then yeah. to show, this is the histopathology slide of yeah. the patient. See, the intracellular yeast Tara. there inside. So, yeah. As what Dr. Lagamayo said, there's an intracellular yeast-like hyaline spheric to oval structures. Yes. Two to four micrometers in diameter, uninsulated yes. with single buds attached by a narrow base consistent yeah. with histoplasma species. Yeah, and with the culture, we demonstrated the tuberculate macroconidia. This is typical for histoplasma. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so this is a case of a non-HIV patient. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. He, he is uh, an immunocompromised patient. Diabetic. Uh, diabetic. Okay. Condition with no travel... Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, after finding all of this, the patient did not follow up already. So he was oh. lost to follow up after the operation. Oh. So that, that's the last, that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jelsa. So um, we have the third case, a case of histoplasmosis. I will just summarize. We have a diabetic patient um, presenting with months, almost three to four months of constitutional symptoms but are non-specific like weight loss and fever and then presents one month after with lymph adenopathy multiple in the cervical area and tonsillar enlargement the tonsillar enlargement was biopsied and it turned out to be tuberculous in nature with a finding of candida i'm not sure and i will ask dr schwartz what the um, importance of the candida isolation in the tonsils is we all know that we have um, we are colonized with candida um, and after which after um, treating for about uh, a month and a half with a combination of itraconazole and fluconazole um, presenting seven months after with another nodular lesion in the penile area, now growing histoplasma. So this is a case of disseminated histoplasmosis. 
So I'd like to ask Dr. Schwartz, here in the Philippines, we really have a few documented cases of histoplasmosis. So it's not really a very uh, high in our differential diagnosis when we're um, presented with um, nodules or cases of fever with lymph nodes. It's mostly still tuberculosis. Um, we do not have serologic tests. We don't have antigen tests and um, antibody tests to detect histoplasma. So, for example, in the first um, in the first few months when they did a biopsy, nothing grew in culture, but it was um, probably histoplasma in biopsy. Will uh, is that already um, accepted as a gold standard for diagnosing histoplasmosis? And maybe you can tell us more about your cases of histoplasmosis there for our knowledge. Uh, sure. So um, I, 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 I uh, totally agree that uh, histoplasmosis is, is going to be much less common than uh, TB. And so it's going to probably there, there are cases, but they are buried underneath the TB. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. Uh, but with that said, uh, that's what they thought in Latin America, places like French Guyana, uh, until they, um, they uh, de developed their medical mycology uh, reference center and, and got a histoplasma urinary antigen test. And then they realized now that um, histoplasmosis is, is actually more common than TB as an AIDS-defining illness. Now, that's Latin America, so it's not necessarily the same as in the Philippines, but what I'm saying is that if you don't look for it, you don't find it. Um, and it can be certainly hard to tease out from a disease that's much, much more common. Um, so uh, the, the biopsy uh, results are enough to make the diagnosis. Um, there are other things that would be on the differential, but particularly with the clinical syndrome, it would, um, it would be most consistent with a dimorphic fungus. So histoplasmosis being the most common um, but there are other ones as well. Sporthrix, for example, can uh, present similarly in, in some ways. Um, and then in terms of diagnostics, I actually, um, I'm just going to share my screen because I have uh, put together just a few um, slides just to wrap up. Is that okay? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, so, let's See if this works. Okay, so first off, uh, my disclosure. So this is a company that's um, that was bringing iSavvy Consult to Canada, um, and hopefully another company will be doing the same thing in um, in uh, the Philippines. So we talked about mucormycosis. Uh, so I'm just going to skip this. All of these uh, points were discussed by the previous speakers in both the radiographic and the, uh, the histological and the biomarker aspects of disease. So. Uh, histoplasmosis, we know it's a dimorphic fungus, so it uh, exists in the mold, in uh, the environment as a mold-like phase, particularly in soils that are enriched by nitrogen, uh, which most commonly comes from guano, uh, the poop of either birds or bats. So uh, here in this case, the, the clue was the lovebirds. Um, it's not necessarily that the lovebirds themselves were carrying the histoplasmosis, but it could be that their poo um, was enriching the soil around this person's uh, uh, domicile. And so that may have uh, made it a more uh, habitable place for um, histoplasma. So once those canidia get inhaled, they can uh, transform from uh, the mold-like phase into a yeast phase, which is more efficient at causing disease in, uh, in patients, so in the lungs, and can also disseminate hematogenously and through lymph nodes elsewhere in the body. Um, very difficult to, to clinically distinguish from TB. It can um, be very similar to acute miliary to TB, as well as uh, more uh, lymph node uh, uh, forms and, and more chronic indolent forms. Uh, we, we made this map a year ago to better reflect where histoplasmosis is in the world. And again, a lot of this is being uncovered as we have more uh, diagnostics that are unrolled or rolled out in specific areas that were previously um, underexplored. 
Uh, and so I, what I what I am currently thinking is that basically histoplasmosis can be anywhere where uh, where there's bats and where there's birds, and that's basically the whole world. Um, with that said, certainly the rates of uh, disease and the prevalence uh, do vary quite uh, substantially. Again, Latin America, the most common. Diagnosis is particularly challenging in the absence of an antigen test. The most important thing is suspicion. And again, I don't fault anybody for uh, thinking that everything is TB, um, you know, for the first, uh, you know, nine times out of 10, mm -hmm. uh, uh, similar syndromes are going to be tuberculosis. Uh, but it's very useful to at least consider the diagnosis of uh, histoplasmosis. You, you won't make the diagnosis unless you consider it. And then tissue is the issue, as we saw in this case. Um, there are some very soft clues like uh, elevated AST to ALT ratio, elevated LDH, lactate lacti uh, dehydrogenase, but they're very, very soft and so can't be relied on. And I can tell you that um, GAFI, the Global um, Alliance for Fungal Infections, has applied for the histoplasma antigen to be included in the WHO's list of essential diagnostics. And so hopefully this will actually make its way um, to the Philippines and, and we'll be able to better delineate the epidemiology. Um, and I, I won't go through uh, uh, treatment, uh, but the, tr the treatment choice is uh, amphotericin B for severe disease followed by itraconazole. In mild disease, you can go straight to itraconazole and treatment is generally um, up to a year in immune compromised patients. This is uh, Alberta. Uh, wel welcome you all to come visit after the pandemic is over. And again, I just wanna thank you all for the opportunity. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Um, I just like to ask how long do we treat histoplasmosis? For example, for this case, apparently it, it came back. How long can we treat disseminated histoplasmosis? Yeah, so for for um, for disseminated disease, you would do no less than six months, uh, up to a year. And it depends, again, on the underlying uh, risk factors, if they can be reversed. So in HIV, for example, uh, with immune reconstitution on ART, you're, you're more reassured that the underlying host factor is taken care of. So a year uh, plus immune reconstitution is adequate. In a, in a patient with diabetes, if you're able to control the diabetes, you're gonna feel more comfortable with stopping. Um, but it would, be, it would be around a year. And uh, the guidelines would be um, somewhere between nine to 12 months, depending on uh, the disseminate, the extent of disseminated disease. Okay, thank you very much. So that concludes our three cases, very interesting cases of mucormycosis, aspergillosis, and histoplasmosis. Again, uh, we'd like to thank everyone for uh, tuning in to the case presentations. And um, Minette, will we have time for some question and answer or, um, or we'll wrap it up? Um, we'll wrap it up. Okay. I think in the Q&A box, there are no more questions. If okay. the audience has any questions, they can send it to the business secretariat and we can forward in a back and forth correspondence. Um, I would like to uh, inform the speakers, our moderator, Dr. Ikarma, and the presenters that we will be giving you certificates of appreciation for participating here in this IFD symposium during the 42nd annual convention of PSMID. We are also showing you, um, going to show you a QR code for which um, we want um, evaluation, of course, of this symposium. And we appreciate that evaluation from all of you. Before we end, I would like to inform you that Dr. Schwartz is willing to share his slides and then we will forward those to you, whoever wants those slides. And we'll also put it in the Pismid Library. Also, uh, I would like to call on Dr. Ronchin Solante to give us the closing remarks. Thank you, Minette. And uh, first of all, allow me to thank uh, all our distinguished speakers, our case presenters, the case panelists, our dynamic facilitator, Dr. K, and of course, our module lead who works hard to come up with this uh, 
uh, workshop. You did an excellent job, all of you, and I hope we still can continue to have several of these uh, workshops in uh, invasive fungal infections. And of course, I would like to thank our delegates. I think we reached around 580 plus. This just shows the interest of this particular topic. And uh, I hope this will also help you in the management of your patients with uh, invasive fungal infections. And lastly, I would like to thank our uh, uh, PSMID organizing committee for giving us this opportunity to be part of this uh, event. And of course, lastly, the to thank also Astellas uh, Philippines for providing us the CME grant to come up with this uh, particular module. Thank you and uh, stay safe. Okay, thank you to everyone. We invite you to attend the other sessions for this annual convention. Yeah, thanks to all. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.